welcome. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, maybe uh, get a couple more cups of coffee in us. Um, and if with that in mind, the bathrooms <laughs> are, are uh, out the door and to the right if you need those. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming today. It's, uh, it's an honor to be part of this. Um, this is the uh, second Southern California Water Affordability Symposium. My name is Kurt Schwabe, and I'm the Associate Dean and Professor of Environmental Economics and Policy here in the School of Public Policy at UC Riverside. It's kind of interesting when you have to actually read your title, isn't it? You just don't have confidence. Um, anyways, um, we have an exciting, uh, information-packed, timely, and policy-relevant uh, morning plan for you. As noted, this is the second uh, Southern California Water Affordability Symposium, the first one occurring in uh, 2019. The goal of this symposium is to provide a space for discussion surrounding affordability that includes the public, elected officials, practitioners, water and government agencies, academic researchers, and community organizations. Today we'll have a discussions associated with the evidence of the problem, the policy and management challenges of those responsible for allocating this increasingly scarce and infinitely valuable resource, the experience and challenges associated with those who both are responsible for delivering the water and those who are in programs to help make water affordable. And finally, the challenges the community confronts in gaining access to clean, reliable, and affordable water. Uh, before we begin and invite up our first distinguished guest, a few items. Again, the bathrooms are to the, down the hall to the right. Um, second, this event will be recorded and that will be available online soon thereafter. Uh, third, um, we have a pretty packed morning, but we'll take a short break around 10.50 uh, for 10 minutes, um, and then we hope to uh, we hope you all stay for lunch. Uh, it's included from 12 to 1, during which time our honorable Eloise Gomez Reyes will be our speaker, and we've allocated time for Q and A with um, Chair Gomez Reyes. Uh, that will be remote as uh, though. Uh, fourth, uh, during the Q and A, which will be part of every session, and in the interest of allowing as many people the opportunity to ask questions as time permits, we ask that you limit your questions to a single question. Uh, and fifth. As you'll see um, in the audience and around here, it's the very well-dressed professional students in the room in here. They are the School of Public Policy's Dean's Ambassadors here, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them. They are amazing students uh, from both our undergraduate degree in public policy and our master's degree in public policy here, and our future leaders. So thank you, ambassadors. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for starting that, Mark. Um, sixth, in addition to thanking the Dean's Ambassadors and the Director of uh, External Engagement, Mark Mendeling, along with John Batres and Nancy Rodriguez for helping put up this symposium, I'd like to also thank our local water agencies, Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District and their uh, General Manager, Greg Thomas, Eastern Municipal Water District and their General, uh, General Manager, Joe Mawad, uh, Western Municipal Water District and the GM, Craig Miller, for, just, for suggesting it's time for another symposium and providing uh, sponsorship and support for this as well as the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and UCANR's California Institute of Water Resources for also helping sponsor the symposium. Okay. With that said, um, I want to give um, uh, Doreen Diadamo a little more time to drink her tea. Uh, you okay? Okay. All right. So I'd like to, uh, it's an honor to invite up uh, Vice Chair of the State Water Resources Control Board, Doreen Diadamo. Uh, Doreen was appointed the State Water Resources Control Board in 2013 and reappointed by Governor Newsom in 2022. She serves as vice chair and also as member with experience in the field of water supply and water quality related to irrigated agriculture. She is a member of the California Air Resources Board from 1999 to 2013 under Governors Brown, Schwarzenegger, and the Davis, where she was instrumental in the board's air quality and climate change programs and regulations. Ms. Diodamo served in various capacities for members of Congress from the San Joaquin Valley over a 20-year period, working primarily on environmental, water, and agricultural legislative policy. Uh, Vice Chair Diodamo earned a bachelor's degree from, from some university up north, like I can say it, Davis, <laughs> okay. uh, and a Juris, uh, Juris Doctorate from the University of Pacific McGeorge School of Law. So please uh, join me in welcoming Vice Chair Doreen Diodamo. <clears throat> Well, good morning. I am 
thrilled to be here. It's great to be on campus, and it, I was telling uh, Professor Suave uh, that it had been a bit since I had been here, and um, it's just really nice to see the changes. And thank you especially to the students that um, have participated in today's symposium. I um, uh, want to also thank the sponsors, and I, I'm just really excited to um, frame the issue for you all, but uh, want to admit I don't consider myself to be an expert on affordability. Um, and so I'm excited to listen and learn um, uh, with, from today's distinguished panelists and other participants. Okay, so I, I think we're all really proud uh, to be in a state where we are the first state in the nation to legislatively recognize the human right to water. Drinking water, as we all know, it, it's a basic human need. And we've taken great strides in California to provide safe drinking water to Californians who for years have not, have, have not had access to drinking water that meets the minimum uh, water quality standards. Um, that's an area that I've been spending a lot of my time on because living in the San Joaquin Valley, um, the safe drinking water is you know, a, a big issue there. I know it's a big issue here as well, but in particular in the San Joaquin Valley. But all the while that we're working on really getting to that first piece of the human right to water, safe drinking water. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that the retail cost of water continues to rise higher than the rate of inflation in California. Affordability and equity remain critical components of our state's mission to fulfill the human right to water. And I'm really proud that in 2021, our board adopted a, a racial equity resolution which specifically articulates our board's commitment to ensuring that all communities have equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water. And I'm just really glad that you'll be hearing from uh, Chair Celeste Cantu from one of our regional boards in San Diego, and I know that's an issue that they are um, modeling um, after our resolution as well. And so we're seeing that our regional water boards are all taking on um, uh, certain principles regarding racial equity that includes um, equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water. Anyway, so the cost of wa water is expected to continue to rise for a number of factors. Um, water systems need to replace their aging infrastructure. Um, they need to meet, meet their water quality standards, um, including new standards that are not yet in place. And so we're going to co continue to see in our quest to provide safe drinking water, we're going to see new standards that will require additional treatment uh, for many water suppliers. And then also maintain a well-trained uh, workforce. And then creating additional pressure on all water systems is climate change. And um, the, the issues that are presented with climate change and looking to make sure that we have resilient water supplies and so that means creating additional water supplies. It, can, it also means um, conserving and you know, being more efficient um, with the water that uh, water districts already have. And so, of course, because water suppliers uh, base their funding on rates, um, if less water is used, then rates oftentimes go up. So there's that conundrum that exists there. About a third of the state's population is considered low income. So the burden of water affordability falls disproportionately on low-income households, many of whom have also seen their income stagnate and are challenged by the high and rising costs of other basic needs, including housing, food, and other utility services. But unlike energy, housing, and food, and other basic needs, California lacks a program to address affordability of water and wastewater services. There have been a number, uh, the legislature has been grappling with this issue for some time, and in uh, 2015, AB 401 was passed and signed into law, and that required our board to submit a report to the legislature. And I think that report's really important because it helps to frame up these issues, uh, providing for findings in the report regarding feasibility of a program, uh, financial stability, and options for a low-income water rate assistance program. Uh, we submitted, it took us a while uh, to prepare that report because it was while we were undergoing um, uh, the newer program regarding safe drinking water, and we submitted that report to the legislature in 2020, and it really helped to frame the discussion. In um, 2022, 
SB 222 by Senator Dodd would have created a low income water rate assistance program. I'm sure you'll be talking about it later today, but this bill was vetoed due to lack of a dedicated ongoing funding source. And so um, there have been ongoing uh, efforts in the legislature, and so I know you'll be hearing um, from the majority leader today, um, uh, focusing really on the structure of the program and funding. But in the meantime, our board has been um, continuing to address affordability within the existing authorities that we have and with the existing resources that we have. And it's important work as it can really help us to build the foundation for future programs. There are three important considerations uh, for water affordability, household affordability, community affordability, water system financial capacity. And the financial capacity of water systems affects future rates and impacts on households. And we've been um, grappling with uh, measuring affordability. And um, in 2020, historically, um, up to 2020, the board and the water sector really relied on percent of median household income. But we see that there are limitations with this metric. It doesn't capture pockets of communities that are struggling to pay bills in service areas that have high incomes. It measures community affordability, not household affordability. And then in 2021, um, as part of our Safe Drinking Water program, we had the release of our first ever statewide drinking water needs assessment. And in that uh, report, we were able to go beyond um, the metric of um, median household income to include two additional metrics, extreme water bills and percent of shutoffs. And then um, uh, collecting that information, though, um, during the pandemic provided, you know, proved to be very difficult because we had a lot of uh, water shutoffs. And then the moratorium that was placed on water shutoffs, uh, that meant that the data that was uh, being collected uh, wasn't collected for a two-year period. And so, um, you know, just continuing to grapple with this issue, our staff held a series of workshops leading to the development of a new metric called Household Socioeconomic Burden. And this considers both poverty prevalence and housing burden costs for um, low-income customers. And it's the first affordability metric that's not reliant solely on water rate data. It allows us to be able to look at an additional 600 community water systems like mobile home parks, communities with domestic wells, and state small water systems. And so in 2023, we officially implemented this new household socioeconomic burden in our annual needs assessment. And all of this really matters because there are a, a number of water suppliers have their own programs. Um, uh, we do at the state board, our counterparts at the Department of Water Resources, our sister agencies, the federal government. All of us are really grappling on uh, which tools can help us to determine best which communities are facing affordability challenges now and which communities will be facing significant challenges in the future. So pending a resolution by this issue uh, at the legislature, there are a number of things that we've been doing at the state to be able to mitigate for affordability challenges. Um, first of all, just our long-going historic programs that we have with our state revolving fund and other programs, grant funding and low-cost loans, and really focusing on uh, the grant uh, programs for disadvantaged communities. And this helps to reduce the cost of large infrastructure projects, helping to mitigate the need for water systems to implement those really uh, large rate increases to cover project costs. And then technical assistance. We have technical assistance providers that really have a lot of latitude in working with local water suppliers on rates and charges and how best to develop customer assistance programs, uh, thoughtful shutoff policies, and things that can be um, uh, undertaken at the local level. And then we have um, an additional fund as a result of the legislature approving uh, the Safe uh, Drinking Water Fund that we now administer. And that allows us um, uh, to, um, under this system, to provide assistance with operations and maintenance. Um, which is, you know, really um, a, a big challenge for some of these uh, smaller systems in particular. And we will uh, start 
be, we will begin a pilot program to use this new funding eligibility to assist systems with affordability challenges. And then two programs um, that I want to focus on, and that's state customer assistance programs. As a result of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, we received $1 billion to assist with debt that was accrued during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, that program was administered by the Water Board, and we directed payments to, uh, directly to water systems and wastewater agencies that allowed them to eliminate the accrued customer debt that had accumulated during that time. And then another program, a different, um, a similar but uh, different in terms of the structure, is the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. That program is administered by the California Department of Community Services and Development, CSD. And uh, that program was funded uh, two, by two sources, uh, federal funds, um, uh, 116 million, and state funds, uh, 200 million. Um, that program is run a bit differently. Um, it applies to a debt accrued pre and post pandemic and it was expanded to include future water bills for eligible customers. Because these programs uh, don't have ongoing funding, though, they will be sunsetting without additional appropriations. And so that's why I think as part of your discussion today, it's important to hear from the legislature. But these programs are structured uh, differently. Uh, applications from water systems for our program and for the CSD program, applications directly from customers. So we really have a unique opportunity uh, with these programs uh, for, case, for a good case study. And lessons learned can help us to shape future water customer assistance programs. Um, these are you know, just really important building blocks as these programs are developed. And so I know there's a lot of issues that um, I, we don't have time. Uh, I wanted to shorten this presentation so that you can get on to hear directly from the experts. Uh, but just want to, um, again, emphasize that lowering costs and making sure that Californians have access to safe and affordable drinking water continues to be a top priority for our board and for this administration and for, for the state. This is, you know, uh, drinking water really pulls quite high and it's something that the whole state is really concerned about. And so we're fortunate to have the, the attention of, you know, all that need to be involved in the development of the program. So pending um, outcome of discussions at the legislature um, and with the governor's office on this topic, it's just important that we continue sort of the nuts and bolts of what we've begun here, and that is to measure and improve our measurement of affordability, monitor the affordability challenges, support programs uh, that mitigate these challenges like the programs that I was talking about, and also support water systems as proactive partners in addressing affordability building upon the lessons learned as we talked about. And then, of course, to continue funding for those uh, infrastructure programs that we know are gonna be so vital to uh, building resilience um, in the future. So um, I look forward to the discussions today and thank you so much for the opportunity to kick things off. Yes, questions, happy. 10 minutes of questions. If anyone wants to come up to the, uh, to the mic and ask the Vice Chair Diadamo any questions regarding affordability in California, this is your time. Everyone's shy early in the morning here. It was that, it was that soft mute mood music. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, I don't know if this applies to affordability, but it's a question that's always spinning around in my head. I'm a local real estate agent, and I deal a lot with people coming in from out of the area. And they're always surprised when I do the initial tours of Riverside that there's so much greenery here, so much grass. Um, and you know, talking about affordability, people are paying to water that grass with potable drinking water. <laughs> and um, you know, I was walking around my neighborhood the other day, and I just witnessed as we were we do a nightly walk, and we've been watching these people work on their yards, and they were they ripped out a beautiful. I thought anyway, water wise garden and put in turf. And I'm like, when, when do we get to the point where we start saying in, in Southern California, especially with our drought conditions, you know, if we're going to have enough water and make water affordable, when do we start saying you can't sell turf anymore or you can't <laughs> put it in anymore if you take it out? 
or if you're redoing, you know, I know we have it in our um, homes where we're required to do water-wise fixtures and that sort of thing, but in, in the landscape, which really takes most of the water, we're not seeing those kind of regulations or, or steps taking place. Time to work on this is now, and we are working on it. So thank you for the question. And this goes to water conservation, and um, what we're doing is shifting, shifting the focus to water use efficiency. So we need to get out from under this, just conserve during drought, you know, this, whether it's 15%, 20%, 25%. Our board was front and center on that because we were the agency during the drought directing um, public water systems to conserve up to a certain percentage. Um, the governor, in the meantime, really messaging statewide that we needed to have an overall reduction, uh, most recently, of 15% um, compared to baseline of two years ago. So all of this gets very confusing because people said, well, how come we're doing 15% now, but in the last drought it was 20 or 25%? And so what we are doing is implementing legislation uh, where we are required to uh, develop water use efficiency in three categories. So last year we adopted, last year or the year before, um, um, uh, water, um, it, I've forgotten the name of the program now suddenly because I'm up here, but um, re, a requirement that all water agencies address um, leaky pipes. And so um, uh, they're fixtures and they do so in a way that is um, feasible for the individual water agency. So that involved us developing an economic model, which was very complex, but that is underway. So that's component number one. And then the legislature has directed what the indoor standard uh, would be by statute. And so um, water systems have a requirement of so many gallons per capita per day, and that is a declining amount over a period of years. And then we're doing the final piece, which is the outdoor piece that you're uh, talking about. And that is developing standards um, for outdoor water use efficiency. And what we're, um, what we're doing here, as is uh, required by the legislature, is it's a budget so that they're, it, they're not being directed, water agencies are not being directed by us as to specifically take out the turf, don't take out the turf. But what we have instead is a budget that's based on what is possible for those water districts, and then they can come up with their own program. So if they want to focus more on indoor reductions, they can. If they want to focus more on outdoor, they can. In the meantime, though, uh, with respect to what, the, what we're looking at, most definitely we're going to see a change because we cannot go on with the system as we know it. And we expect that implementation of these standards will allow us to save uh, about 500,000 acre feet, which is, you know, the size of a small reservoir annually. And so um, we'll be working on this this year, and I expect that there'll be a real robust conversation about exactly how we should move forward on the outdoor piece. And in the meantime, though, we, we do have um, um, ongoing re uh, requirements as a result of the governor's executive order and we have a piece that's focused on non-functional turf, uh, particularly in the commercial, industrial, and um, institutional sector. So that is one area where we are gonna be uh, more directive in terms of what you're allowed to do. Otherwise, it'll be up to the local water suppliers. It's there. It's on. Um, I, I was listening to a, a faculty. We had a faculty lecture over at RCC, and he was giving a, an environmental talk. So this is on the climate change thing. And one of his points was it's 600 gallons of water for a quarter pounder. And it brought to mind, I used to work in government, and I was on SCAG Energy Technical Committee, and I remember one of the things that struck me, and this was long ago, because I was, the energy element for municipalities was optional then. And I was shocked to learn that of all the energy, the nuclear, not just, you know, the fossil fuel, the coal, but all the solar, the oil, the natural gas, the wind, you know, all of it, 
of all the energy that's generated, 20% of it goes to pumping water. And I was just wondering if you had any update on that because, you know, it was a while ago, but that's an incredible amount of energy that we are, we're dedicated, which I'm surprised hasn't been part of the conversation. Well, thank you for that. And I think the number is a little higher. Uh, if we include more, it's more like 30%, I believe, if we include uh, the cost to um, obtain the water, treat it, convey it, move it. Um, especially, you know, look at the pumps, moving them water all the way to Southern California from Northern California. That's why it's really important that we, de that we get better at developing local supplies. But those programs are costly. You know, um, the days are over where we can totally rely on our snowpack from Northern California. That used to be, in history, a third of our reservoir storage. So it's at the snowpack acts as a reservoir. Well, we know that what we're going to see is more like what we saw this year with this, you know, atmospheric rivers, the amount of precipitation coming in quickly, going fast. And so we've got to figure out ways to rethink our system to incorporate flood control into water supply, getting that water into the ground where we can, developing additional conveyance systems. And then here in Southern California, you know, cleaning up our groundwater basins. Uh, cleaning up the basins, capturing storm water, putting it to beneficial use. But that gets back to, into what we're talking about with respect to affordability. So as we move toward a more climate resilient future, you know, with this hotter and drier climate, we, it, we, it's incumbent upon us to develop those supplies, but those supplies are costly. Look at a recycled water project, for example. Many communities are moving toward recycled water we have, uh, you know, grant programs for recycled water, but those are expensive systems, and it can affect affordability. So I think that's why the conversation today is so important, because how do we, um, how do we structure our system such that it's not just the financially stable, wealthier uh, systems that are able to afford a recycled water project, but so that it's equitable for all? Um, and that uh, those ongoing water supplies are available without be falling disproportionately on the low income. So 30% of like emissions and so forth. Yes, for you know, all the components. Well, it's, it's, it's in there, but I agree, it needs to be further highlighted, yes. Thank you. to your description of all the agencies that are involved in the programs to help with affordability. Is there any mechanism to coordinate their efforts to prevent any what we call crowding effect? You know, some uh, issues that can be uh, affecting the efficiency of the work of these agencies. Of the development of the programs? Yeah, D yes. Well, I, I think that's why symposiums like today are just really helpful. Because um, here we are at the state looking at, you know, what, what type of, just for example, should a low, in, uh, low income rate assistance, should it go to water suppliers? Should it go directly to the customers? How, uh, if we were to create a system that goes directly to the customers, and I think you'll probably have some panels that will be talking about this, but if we were to create a system like that, just think of, you know, how we, how we would start from scratch to gather the data, collect the information, and then put forth a system that would work for the 400-plus different water suppliers throughout the state. Kind of different from our energy suppliers, you know, where we don't have... Um, as many utilities as we do water systems. So um, could we learn from other programs, like for example, the um, uh, low income rate assistance program that many of the, uh, that, that they have in the energy sector, could we utilize those customer bills in order to implement uh, a low income rate assistance program? That might save money by just 
you know, uh, piggybacking onto another program that already exists. I don't pretend to be the expert, uh, but I've been in government long enough that um, I hate to see a good idea take a long time to implement and uh, be costly to implement as you develop the framework. So, you know, really looking to learn from other programs as to, you know, how to sort of jumpstart things in a thoughtful way. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Call up our panel, uh, session one panelists uh, to the stage. And um, uh, today we'll have a brief presentation on water affordability in Southern California and at, and at some local agencies, both regionally and a few agencies. Uh, and because water affordability is, is largely influenced uh, by water quality, we'll have a discussion of water quality and infrastructure costs. And then finally, because housing affects everything related to affordability in general, um, it's the 800 pound gorilla. We'll have uh, a discussion of that. Actually, why don't we do one at a time then, so you're not, you don't have to look or turn around to see this slide. So I'll invite up Mehdi Namadi first. Yeah, that seems to be. Otherwise, the panelists sitting up here, they have to kind of crane their neck. And so you go ahead and stay seated, and I'll call you up when it's your time. Thanks. Mixed messages. My kids don't like that. All right. All right, so our panelist, first panelist today is Dr. Mehdi Namadi, an assistant professor of water resource economics and policy here at the School of Public Policy. Um, with a strong focus on applied econometric methods and big data analysis, Dr. Namadi, Namadi leads a policy-oriented research and education program centered around urban municipal water management. His expertise lies in investigating economic issues such as affordability and conservation programs, including alternative pricing structures, social norms, and turf replacement. He actively collaborates with government agencies and industry leaders in California to tackle pressing water policy challenges. Dr. Mahdi, Namadi earned his PhD and master's degree in environmental economics at the University of Kentucky and leads the Water Dialogue Lab at UC Riverside. Please welcome, uh, help me, join me in welcoming Dr. Namadi. Thank, thanks very much, Kurt, uh, for having me and for the nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and see many of the familiar faces that we We've worked over the years, these last four or five years, in, in one place. So we'd like to uh, talk about, a little bit about um, our research on local, regional, and, and statewide affordability numbers that we, we have been working on. Um, but before I do that, I want to like to acknowledge the, the agency's role in, in both funding our students, but also providing the necessary data uh, to, and work with their staff and, and, and also to uh, provide feedback on the process. This has been a uh, great help to us in, in, the, in the past five years. Uh, this is a joint work by Kerr Trawi and, uh, and, and is a summary of this past four years. Okay. So uh, to just uh, uh, reiterate what the vice chair said, the affordability has been getting increasing attention in the state and uh, both in terms of the legislations that we see, but also the cost of water uh, or the expenditure of water has been on the rise, right? And we did a survey of 130 utilities across the state, and what we are finding is that um, the cost for, uh, or the expenditure for the households for, uh, for 60 CF, which is 55 gallons per day per capita for a, for a family of three, uh, increased by about 100% since 1990s. And, and that's about 4.5% increase per, per year. And on the other side, it's, it's likely to continue. And in the future, as, as the vice chair mentioned, the aging infrastructure is well documented that, that this is going to be uh, increasing the expenditure. Uh, the water quality, both in terms of the, the e water quality issues, but also the new standards that we have, Maura to talk about it, and then uh, climate-induced water scarcity, both in terms of adoption to, to climate change, but also the portfolio of the resources uh, of water sources available to the agency. And then on the other side of the story, we talk about discretionary income, which is income minus any cost of essential needs, and, and including water. That's, uh, that's been an issue for 13 million low-income residents in California, 
and the risk just has been stagnated uh, in, the, in the recent years. And uh, to just remind you that affordability is um, uh, measured in different ways, but by, based on EPA, the threshold for median household income is about 2% uh, for water, 4.5% uh, for water and wastewater. The State Water Resources Control Board has 1.5% of the median household income for, for water services. And uh, anything in uh, blue here is the, is the thing that, that we are working on, and, but I'm not uh, going to talk about it due to the time, but happy to discuss more. But those on red, uh, these are things we are going to talk about. First, we start with the regional water affordability analysis, both in terms of magnitude but on, and the variation across the region. And then we do a much deeper analysis of the household level uh, data to see uh, within two individual districts uh, to see how, um, how we can identify vulnerable households that maybe an agency level analysis or, or the, as the vice chair said, the community level analysis may mask uh, from, from, from your finding. And uh, the, the, what we call um, affordability measure is, is really a water expenditure ratio. And, and that's a function of household expenditure on water services. A water service could be a water service for uh, 55 gallons per day per capita. That's what we are going to use today. It could be t total water use within a household and, and, and so on and so forth, right? uh, which is uh, important to consider when we talk about and discuss affordability uh, numbers uh, across the state. And then uh, divided by household income, and, and income is also a question. Is this a median household income within the agency level? Is this the 20th percentile income within the agency? Is this a census tract level uh, income? And, and that's important to consider, again, when we look at the numbers uh, that comes out of the report. And then also we are going to highlight the relationship between affordability metrics and also the socioeconomics for, th for these two individual agencies. And then uh, finally with delinquencies and how that can explain the, the affordability measures. So the three case studies, one we have uh, uh, from Metropolitan Water District uh, service area, there are about 160 retail agencies that, that we are looking at in the region. Uh, and and um, we collect both water and wastewater costs for, uh, from 2013 for these agencies and income by census tract for, for, for these agencies. And then we have two case studies which we look at in more detail, uh, Eastern Municipal Water District and Elsino Valley Municipal Water District. Uh, uh, we have data um, since 2011 at the household level uh, for all the uh, single family residential accounts uh, in, in these uh, districts, uh, about uh, 15 million of data points, about uh, 138,000 accounts in Eastern and, and, uh, and about uh, 38,000 in Elsino Valley. And uh, in both of these cases, we look at the affordability measures, but in, in Elsinore Valley, we look at also bill delinquency and how that changed over time in, in Elsinore Valley. So just uh, key findings, uh, the, the study uh, that we are doing with Matt is, is ongoing, it's just in the start. Uh, but what we were able to do so far is that we collected data on 112 retailers out of the 160 or so. And uh, we see that weighted median household income varies quite significantly within these agencies across the region from about $50,000 to, to $210,000. And uh, right now we are doing uh, how uh, the cost of water, water and wastewater services for 60CF and how that depends on the agency characteristics like size, water sources, and if they implemented any conservation programs including advanced meter infrastructure. But just some uh, quick uh, findings that we are having here right now is that water expenditure ratio in the region across these uh, 112 agencies varies between uh, 0.14 to, to 1.76 for, for water services. And if we do look at water and wastewater services uh, together, we, we have 0.22 to 1.89% of the median household income. And, and just a reminder, the EPA's threshold for this uh, water services to not be affordable is two a percent of median household income, and, and for water and wastewater is 4.5 percent. And if you look at the number of agencies that, um, that, um, that are above the uh, state water resources control threshold, threshold is, is only two agencies right now. And uh, when we look at more, in more detail to, to Eastern Municipal Water District, uh, and I'm only showing two measures of water services that we use, 
one for indoor standard, which is a uh, 55 gallons per day per capita, and then one total or actual water use uh, within the households. And uh, the blue dots here are each single household in the, in the agency. And these are all, again, single family residential household. Uh, the red uh, threshold is 4.5%. And we are looking water and wastewater uh, expenditure ratio in 2019 in the graphs. And what we are seeing on average for, for Eastern Municipal, well, water and wastewater expenditure ratio is 1.1% of the median household income. And if we lower the income to 20th percentile, of the income in the, in the agency, it, it goes up to 1.44. It's still much lower than 4.5% uh, of the uh, defined thresholds by the EPA. But what is not showing us is, is this uh, masking out the households that may have affordability issues. And when we do look at household level analysis, we do find a few, but still uh, households, 69 households out of the 138,000 households that they, they are vulnerable and, and, and they are at the risk of uh, water and wastewater services not being affordable. And we look at the actual water uses, uh, the numbers also, again, about 550. And, and this is not affordability, this is the expenditure ratio that they go beyond 4.5%. Um, and this is the total water use. So just a reminder that total water use is not uh, a measure of uh, water services for affordability. Uh, and we look at the Ilsino Valley Municipal Water District, and, and the findings are pretty similar. Uh, water and wastewater expenditure ratios are, are much below the, the threshold that is defined by the state or by the, by the EPA. Uh, but when we do look at the household level analysis, we find these households that are vulnerable and that can help us to, to design programs to target these households uh, and, and take actions for, for these specific households. Just as some uh, key findings, it's, we, we're short in time here, but uh, what we are finding from these three analyses, the type of services matter. Uh, are you looking at the indoor water use versus actual water use? That's, uh, that's important in our measures. And, and income measures also matter. As the vice chair mentioned, uh, the, is this a median household income at the district level or 20th percentile income? Or is the, the at the census tract level, right? And then if you put those together, uh, affordability can, can vary significantly uh, when we look at, uh, at the water district level analysis versus the household level analysis. And, and we, we want to be careful when we are looking at these numbers. And um, the results show that the, the, those that host households from these two agencies, that they are above the 4.5% uh, threshold of the EPA, they are more likely to be, or, or they are in block groups that are uh, associated with lower median household income, and not surprisingly. Uh, but the, the higher percentage of rent are occupied in, this, uh, in these block groups. And uh, lower median gross rent, but the important uh, key finding here is that higher median rent as a percentage of total income. And, and, and that means that with, with housing costs as a share of total income we have increasing in the, in the region, uh, the, the amount that is left for other services, including water, could be uh, more and more challenging in, in the years ahead, and, and Stan is going to talk about that a little bit for us. And then uh, next, we look at delinquency of, uh, of uh, water bills uh, in Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District service area. In the graph, we have share of the customers that their bill is delinquent, they did not pay it with the first notice uh, in the blue line up to the, the fourth notice in the yellow line. And what we are concerned about is those that they didn't pay after the third notice. And that's about 2% on average of the customers in the service area. Uh, over time, we don't see that change much. Uh, and, and when we look at those uh, delinquent accounts and, and their characteristics, and this is again a correlation, we see that they are uh, in lower median household income uh, block groups. Uh, they are more likely to have higher water expenditure ratios. And, and we see that they, uh, they have less irrigated areas, less likely to be within the budget that is defined by Elsinore Valley Municipal. Uh, they have higher water use and, and also uh, less likely to participate in, in rebate programs uh, that the, the agency is offering, and as well as the automated payment services. Uh, again, if you want to acknowledge, this is the correlation. We are further doing, analyzing this uh, for, for, to see how especially participating in rebate programs can help reduce the delinquency and, as a result, affordability challenges. 
And uh, the expenditures uh, on water and compared to other services in the region, we are seeing housing, food, and transportation. They take a big chunk of the, 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 the income uh, in, in the region. And then when we look at water and sewer, even at the 20th percentile, that's about 1.44 and 1.90 for, for these agencies at the 20th percentile of the median household income. Um, And uh, just a final uh, few t t uh, key takeaways is that uh, water in the region, that's, you're finding that is amidst uh, the EPA's and the State Water Resource Control Board uh, requirements or thresholds. We are seeing in, in MET region, we, the, it varies between 0.22 to 1.89 in percent of the median household income. Uh, for El Eastern and Elsinore Valley, we see that's about 1.1 and 1.5 on average. But, uh, Delenco, but uh, Delenco analysis suggests that policy options to reduce affordability challenges, and that includes uh, coming up with policies that uh, encourages customers to participate in rebate programs and, and as a result lower their water use or be become more efficient water users. Uh, but the household level analysis uh, is also important to, to identify these households, uh, to, to bring a more accurate picture of the affordability challenges and also to build their design programs and target programs for these households and, and actions that the state is taking. And uh, the uh, final uh, key takeaway is that affordability is a local issue. Uh, and by that I mean that we, have, we do have an income that is representative of the state income levels. And, uh, but what we do not have that is representative is the cost of providing water services. And that includes the investments these agencies made across the years and the portfolio of water uh, uh, sources that is available to them, which not, might made, may, may not be the same in, in Central Valley or other regions in the state. Uh, so the location investment uh, matters uh, when we are looking at these this numbers. And I also want to finish up with, uh, with, with, with acknowledging that we are looking at single family residential households in this analysis. And what we are leaving out is multifamily renter occupied houses and, and, and that could be which could be affordable, it could be more challenging for them. So further analysis requires to, to see how that uh, shapes in the region for these multifamily households. Thank you, May. Um, we'll hold off on questions until after all three panelists speak. <clears throat> So our second, second panelist today uh, is going to discuss water quality issues <clears throat> and relationships to affordability is Dr. Mara Allaire. Uh, Mara is an assistant professor at UC, UC Irvine uh, with expertise in water economics and spatial statistics. Her research focuses on assessing equity in drinking water quality and decision support for water resource management. Her professional experience spans the public and private sectors, including international organizations such as World Bank, Fulbright. Uh, think tanks such as Resources for the Future and the International Water Management Institute and environmental consulting firms such as AMIEC. She holds a PhD from the University of, Calif uh, University of North Carolina and was a postdoc fellow at Columbia University's Earth Institute. She currently runs the Water Equity Lab at UC Irvine. Please join me in welcoming Lara, Dr. Allaire. Good morning, everybody. Good to be here uh, from UC Irvine, just down the road. Um, so yes, I uh, focus on issues of water equity uh, over at Irvine and at the Equity Lab. I study disparities in water quality across California and also the country and look at how governance and policies at various levels uh, of government can improve water security. And today, I'd like to discuss um, the connection between regulation and water affordability and also share uh, some new research. So, as many of you know, water bills vary dramatically across California. This figure shows how high water bills are for the 385 largest water systems. And these systems serve over 90% of Californians. And what are some takeaways from this? Well, over 20% of systems have 
water bills that exceed $80 per month. And on the other side of things, there are also about 20% uh, of water utilities that have low monthly bills, less than $40. Per month, which raises concerns about uh, financial capacity of utilities. And the costs of providing safe water are rising because of a need to meet new treatment standards, replacing aging infrastructure, and diversifying raw water supplies. One driver um, that I'll discuss uh, for rising costs is the need to keep up with ever-changing regulations. Drinking water regulations um, change over time. The Safe Drinking Water Act has gone from regulating a few dozen contaminants in the 1980s to just over 90 contaminants currently. And there's a learning curve when new regulations are created or when rules are updated. This graph shows the number of water systems in California uh, that are in violation of health-based standards of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And if you take a look at the vertical gray lines, this is when new federal and state regulations are introduced. And we notice that immediately after the, when these new regulations take hold, there tends to be a jump in violations. Again, because there's a learning curve. So if we take, for example, in the mid-2000s, when new regulations came into effect regarding disinfection byproduct rules, we see at the very bottom there's this dashed gray line that shows DDPs or disinfection byproduct uh, violations and the number of utilities that are struggling with these. And we see, lo and behold, after these new disinfection byproduct rules take hold, there's an uptick in the number of systems that are struggling to comply. And similarly for arsenic, after a new arsenic standard, uh, an MCL took hold uh, in the mid-2000s, we also see increased number of systems struggling uh, with arsenic violations. And now, of course, uh, we're looking at PFAS, uh, and to comply, Californian utilities are forecasted to have a spending need of over $880 million. Um, and currently, in general, regulatory burdens are not fully assessed by the federal EPA. When new rules are proposed, the EPA evaluates affordability of compliance, but this is limited to determining whether an average household water bill will exceed 2.5% of median household income. And this is median household income nationwide. Local income levels are not considered in terms of what community level income is within a particular water district. Um, and so without accounting for customer level income, uh, uh, the, uh, these analyses are limited. It's unknown if regulations are affordable for a particular water district. And these unacknowledged regulatory burdens are likely to fall on water systems, especially serving low-income communities. Uh, this became very clear when a revised arsenic standard uh, came into effect in the mid-2000s. The federal EPA assessment didn't anticipate compliance challenges, especially within California. Um, the EPA analysis concluded that this rule change would be affordable for systems of all sizes, but the state of California reached a very different conclusion because the California Department of Public Health at the time took into account, well, first, income levels of communities served by these water districts and also state-specific compliance costs. And so the state of California foresaw that this revised rule would be unaffordable for most small systems serving low-income communities. And this remains a blind spot for federal EPA analysis. This leads us to some new research that my group conducted, and this addresses how California water systems are doing with providing safe water across the state and what disparities persist. Surprisingly, few studies addressing disparities have been done in regards to drinking water quality compliance. 
Most equity-related studies have addressed ambient water quality, violations of the Clean Water Act, but not for drinking water quality. And so this is largely because of a major data gap. There isn't demographic information collected for water districts across the state of California, and certainly not across the country. Um, and so this means that we have a tough time addressing environmental justice concerns. The EPA, uh, the EPA's tool, Environmental Justice Screen, currently does not include drinking water, again, because of this major data gap. And so I began to address this data gap in, in California and now more recently across the country by making use of spatial analysis and by taking the boundaries of water system service areas, overlaying this with US Census information and generating the very necessary data sets that you would need to begin to explore equity concerns within drinking water quality compliance. Um, and so to do this, I was uh, doing a technique called aerial weighting, where I was taking US Census information available at the zip code level, overlaying this with water system service areas, and then calculating water district specific information on a whole variety of demographics. The demographics I'll focus on today include median household income, uh, as well as um, percent of customers in various racial and ethnicity uh, categorizations. And so what this study finds is some good news and some bad news. I'll start with the good news. The good news is that after California legislated the human right to water and major provisions came into effect in regards to this, compliance has dramatically improved across the state. We see that when the State Water Board uh, gained the powers to force consolidation in 2015, we see in the blue line the number of water systems in violation of drinking water standards um, declined dramatically. So this is great news. It seems that improvements um, are happening, change is happening. Um, and what do we see across the state in terms of concentrations of violations? Well, this is probably uh, known information to those, most, uh, those of you in the audience. There seems to be uh, problems especially concentrated in the San Joaquin Valley, in Imperial Valley, as well as the Northern Cascade regions. Now, what is some of uh, the bad news that came out of this study? Well, it seems that there are equity concerns. It seems that there are some compliance gaps that persist across communities. Let's take a look at differences in compliance by income levels. If we take a look at those uh, water districts that serve communities that are categorized by as severely disadvantaged uh, by the state based on median household income, we really see in this solid uh, line on top the portion of systems uh, serving severely disadvantaged communities uh, are much more likely to be in violation of Safe Drinking Water Act standards compared to everybody else. Uh, on average across this study, 20-year uh, study period, uh, severely disadvantaged communities have had uh, violation rates double those of other systems. And if we take a look at the most uh, recent year for which this study conducted analysis, uh, 2018, we see that um, there's well over a 10 percentage point gap in compliance in terms of uh, severely disadvantaged communities uh, having much more prevalent violations compared to everybody else. So there seems uh, work to be done. Some good news out there, but also work to be done. Um, and if we also take a look uh, by race and ethnicity, what's going on here? Well, we also see persistent compliance gaps. Um, those uh, systems serving African-American communities, um, much more of them are in violation of Safe Drinking Water Act standards than others, and also those serving Latino communities. So again, work to be done. Um, if we go into some statistical analysis, 
What I thought was particularly interesting is if we separate systems out by small systems and large systems and see what disparities exist within small systems and also within large systems. Because hopefully, uh, we, we, would, we would hope that large systems would have the technical, managerial, and financial capacity to comply, and we would hope by sheer scale alone that they might overcome uh, some of these challenges. So what happens if we just take a look at the smaller systems? Well, there does seem to be significant associations between uh, income uh, as well as race in terms of the likelihood of incurring health-based violations. But then what's most concerning is if we jump up to the larger systems. Some of these uh, associations begin to break down once we jump to the larger systems. Income is no longer significantly associated with getting a violation once we jump up to these larger systems. But what persists is those systems serving African American communities still have this significant link between um, serving those communities and being more at risk for incurring violations. Um, and so what are some takeaways from this? Well, it seems that California has made progress um, but there still seems work to be done in terms of better targeting assistance to low-income areas and also communities of color. Um, and at the federal level, perhaps we can finally revise the way that um, affordability analysis is done. Updates have already happened for the Clean Water Act in terms of evaluating rule changes there. It, could perhaps be great to see similar changes for Safe Drinking Water Act uh, side of things. So I'll close out there, uh, pass things along, and looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> Next, I'd like to uh, invite up our third panelist today, Dr. Stan Okolopkia. A uh, visiting professor uh, at UC Riverside School of Public Policy and an incoming assistant professor in the public policy uh, program at Tulane University. Stan's research focuses on state and local politics with special attention to housing policy. He has been published in some of the top journals including the American Political Science Review, Electoral Studies, Research in Politics, Societies, and State Politics and Policy Quarterly. Uh, Stan holds a PhD in political science from UC San Diego and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Southern California. Please join me in welcoming Stan. Check, check. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out to a windowless room uh, early in the morning. Appreciate it. Um, like Kurt said, I primarily do work on housing policy. And so I'm a bit of an interloper at your gathering today. So thanks for being so cool and welcoming me. So um, this is obviously a gathering about water affordability. I work on housing affordability and housing policy. And Kurt asked me to explain to everyone here what we all need to know about housing policy in the 10 minutes I have. So whirlwind tour. OK, so there's a common refrain, especially here in California, that you hear a lot from elected officials and people in the wider discourse. And it goes something along the lines that housing markets are segmented. We have a market for high-end homes, we have a market for middle-end homes, and then there's this low-end market for affordable homes. And it leads many elected officials to say that we aren't in the midst of a housing crisis, but we're in the midst of an affordable housing crisis. So here we have um, LA Mayor Karen Bass in an interview with the LA Times from earlier this year to say, um, is this button, here we go. She's not sure if the city needs more luxury housing. You know, in some areas there's a great need, but in some areas there's a need for affordable housing, especially in parts of the inner city that are now being gentrified. So um, San Francisco Supervisor Dean Preston is a lot more forceful. On Twitter last year he said, called it market rate housing, luxury housing, housing for millionaires, but whatever you want me to call it, it's not my top priority. I'm busy focusing on housing working class people. 
um, or housing working class people can afford and housing for people that are homeless. I'm not a fan of trickle down theory. Even some people at um, Southern, of Southern California's other policy schools, like former LA City Council member Zev Yaroslavsky, former supervisor and now professor of practice there, says, the bottom line is that we have an affordable housing crisis. We don't have a market rate housing crisis. Well, what I'm gonna talk about today is the fact that we have a singular housing crisis. And the reality is that housing markets aren't segmented and we're all suffering through the same housing crisis. Though the effects are most disproportionately borne by people at the bottom end of the income ladder. Right, so we have this housing crisis that stems from decades of underbuilding here in the state. And our housing crisis is first and foremost a supply crisis. California just simply hasn't built enough relative to demand. And this underproduction of new market rate housing diminishes the supply of affordable housing for those at the bottom end of the income ladder. And finally, this housing crisis is almost entirely, the blame of it rests on California cities, who over the past several decades created barriers to the construction of new housing in their cities. And so the way out of this crisis long term is through the construction of new housing. And so state legislation must supersede a lot of the local authority that we've given to the cities in order to reach these goals. So there's some terms that um, we should know before we get into this, like what is market rate housing and what is affordable housing. So market rate housing refers to housing that's generated by the real estate market without a direct subsidy. And prices in market rate housing, as the name might imply, are set by the market. Affordable housing, however, is built either with a federal tax credit, the LIHTC system being the most often utilized, or by developers at a loss in exchange for some other concession. Either they're getting a break from parking requirements, density limits, you name it. And price for affordable, deed-restricted affordable housing is set at the income level of the resident. Now, as of 2021, just about 11% of all multifamily housing, right, so single-family housing excluded, was deed-restricted affordable housing here in the state of California. So the vast majority of Californians, including low-income Californians, live in market-rate housing. It's just market-rate housing that's not as expensive. And so what we see when we look at housing production in California compared to a state like Texas is that housing production in our state has been anemic since about the recession of the early 90s. Compare us to Texas and we see this stark difference. We've produced less housing over the last decade than even we did during the 1990s trough. And when we separate California metros out by inland or coastal metros, we see the difference become even more acute. So again, since the 1990s, coastal California, where the preponderance of California's jobs are, has simply refused to build their, their fair share. And this creates a lot of upward pressure on regions of California, like the Inland Empire, that were previously affordable. So when we think about housing, we should think about a game of musical chairs. It's probably the best way to understand how production at the top eventually impacts people at the bottom. So when we have a shortage like we do now, it breeds downward rating. So the wealthy that are priced out of home ownership go towards the top end of the rentals that pushes the slightly less wealthy down to take up what used to be middle class rentals on and on until eventually middle income people are taking what used to be working class rentals and those who would have taken those rentals are either displaced from a region or pushed out into the street. If we add supply, it allows for upward filtering. This dynamic works in a different direction. So the best paper on that is something that came out about two years ago in the Journal of Urban Economics by a guy named Evan Mast, who's an economist at Notre Dame. And what he did was he examined this migration chain that's caused by 700 new market rate developments around the country. Right, so he looks at who moves into these new market rate developments, who moved into their old place, on and on and on for a chain of six moves, I believe. And what he finds is that 
building 100 new market rate units, the top of the market, aka luxury housing, leads to 45 to 70 people moving out of below median income neighborhoods within three years, right? Making room at the top creates slack at the bottom, right? New market construction towards the top of the market will lead to vacancies toward the bottom, right? And so in constrained markets like California, we see households filtering up when scarcity is relieved. Now, some people might say that there's this, you know, new construction is going to lead to higher housing costs, it might promote gentrification, et cetera. The preponderance of empirical evidence shows that this is wrong, right? So we have a paper from Kate Pennington um, from UC Berkeley's uh, Department of Economics from 2021, and she finds that new production lowers rents by 2% within 100 meters of a new building. Uh, Shaudi Lee from NYU finds a similar effect looking at upzonings in lower Manhattan and a team of researchers from the Upson Institute looking nationally finds a considerable decline nearby. So what can policymakers do right now? Well, local officials have a lot of leeway over zoning. And so local officials, if they want, can rezone their communities for dense multifamily development, right? Recent legislation like SB 10 allows locals to do this without hitting some of the procedural barriers like CEQA, right? It's harsh to say, but cities that aren't doing this right now simply aren't serious about making housing more affordable. State elected officials have a lot of tools at their discretion to streamline the production both of market rate and affordable housing. There's legislation being debated right now, SB 423, that would make permanent rules that allow for buy-right construction of housing with an affordability component in cities that refuse to build their fair share during our about decade-long um, RENA cycles, right? And sort of broadly speaking, statewide officials can create fair and predictable and uniform land use rules across jurisdiction so housing can be built region-wide, right? We have to remember that demand for housing is regional, not local. And finally, housing and community development can do a lot more to hold scofflaw cities accountable. We're in the middle of an approval process for the RENA cycle right now, and a lot of cities are simply doing what they've done for decades and submitting questionable housing elements. For example, the city of Sausalito said it's going to um, find some new sites and upzone them for new development, but oh, um, it just happens that these sites are actually underwater. And on April 28th, um, Sausalito's housing development element was uh, found compliant by HCD. So the good news for us in California is that we can start digging out of this housing crisis whenever we want to. All we need to do is change laws, and changing laws is free, right? So we chose to prohibit new home construction in the state about 30 years ago. And this led to us having the second highest poverty rate when measured with the US Census's supplemental poverty measure. It led to us having the third highest rate of rent burdening, and most notably led to us being home to 30% of America's homeless population and 50% of its unsheltered homeless population. So there's no long-term solution to housing affordability that doesn't begin with easing barriers to new construction. Right? And so solving the housing crisis is going to involve a lot of courage from elected officials because it's going to involve stepping on a lot of third rails of politics. But the choice for elected officials is pretty stark. Elected officials can continue and placate wealthy NIMBYs in their communities or in their, in their districts, or they can start working to actually make the lives of Californians better. Um, thanks for listening. That's my time. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Stan. <clears throat> now I'd like to invite up the other two panelists for about uh, yeah. 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A, if, if there is that. So, uh, Mara and uh, Mehdi.
The, the question is, what's the third rail? Yeah, so third rail, like literally, is the electrified rail on like a subway. So if you step on it, it kind of zzz, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. We should. And we could. Tomorrow will be joining us shortly. Um, <laughs> no running. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, if you have any questions for the panelists, please feel free to come up to the mic. Again, uh, make sure they, they request that there are questions and one question per person if there are any. I'm a really polite light group here. Just to fill in until somebody else comes up to the mic, on your, 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 first of all, you say that California prohibited new housing construction in 1993. Is that what you, how did that happen? So many California cities, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles notably, um, started changing their zoning codes to lower what's known as the zone capacity of the city. So famously in Los Angeles, Proposition U was passed in 1986, which shrunk LA's zone capacity from about 10 million people to about 4 million. It did things like increase parking minimums, um, lower density, minimum densities, uh, enacted height restrictions. It's actually kind of interesting. So most of the structures in San Francisco and Los Angeles, like if God forbid there was an earthquake or something, couldn't be rebuilt in their present form because they're simply outside of the zoning code. So that was the major way in which uh, California cities did that. So, so prohibiting it is a little bit of an overstatement. I mean, if it's against the zoning code, it's against the law and thus prohibited. So I don't know. Okay, um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Adrian Hightower, Metropolitan Water District, really uh, uh, looking forward to the conclusions of your study. Um, one of the challenges seems to be the metrics that we're using in terms of medium household income, because that presumes that that household income is enough to maintain a household in uh, the growing inflation and, and uh, markets that we, we're dealing with. Is there another metric um, that we can use that might be more representative of what um, low income or all of us are, are actually dealing with. Um, I guess my point is that uh, it doesn't matter if it's 2% or 3% of a medium household income if the medium household income itself is insufficient to, to, for your needs. So any other metrics that you think might be applicable? Thanks for the question, yes. It's not just me, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's all of them. Thanks for the question. Yes, uh, there are a few other metrics. Within median household income, we can play around a little bit with it, right? The 20th percentile, so that's the 20th percentile of the median household income. But also is um, um, other measures that is a proxy for, for, um, for affordability challenges, like delinquency, shut offs, right? Who is not paying their bills after a third, fourth notice, and, and they face a shut off, right? These, these probably ch they have challenges with income. So, so these are some other uh, sort of um, metrics to go around that median household income. Another thing we are trying to do is, is median home value and, and home value using tax assessor data. So this is individual home values in, in within each district, and, and that's a um, yeah, it requires a lot of more data, but, but a little bit more accurate measure. And just to add to that, um, Theodora uh, came up with a good idea uh, in 2019, I believe, saying using uh, minimum wage and looking at how many hours at the minimum wage does it take to afford, say, six CCFs. And so that would be something that account gets at uh, more localized issues as well. So that would be another, another metric that would be uh, uh, you, really useful to, to look at as well. Thanks. Mara or Stan? 
I think another consideration, especially as um, you know, either statewide analysis or even nationwide analysis is done, is that the U.S. Census, as of the 2020 Census, started adding a lot more noise to median household uh, income, and so more accurate measures, especially if you want really high-resolution data, might be to rely on uh, percent poverty rates uh, within um, districts. That's one thing I've noticed. Dr. Allaire, this question is, I think, directed to you. In your presentation, uh, the trend line that really took a dramatic drop in noncompliance in around 2018 or where, wherever it was, looked like it started before SB 88. Um, and your oral comments seem to indicate that the, the forced consolidation uh, authorization for the State Water Board really was the cause but I wondered if that trend started really before that and if there may be some other correlation that, you're, that you've found there. So I didn't dive into the causality of it, um, but in, in current research, I am very much interested in exploring the various provisions that came into effect under human right to water to understand what might have been associated with just that dramatic turnaround. So uh, valid question, and it's absolutely a, a relevant one that's, that's currently being explored. Thanks. Hello, um, Vicki Mendez, undergraduate UCR public, um, School of Public Policy. Um, so I guess my question is, is how are we taking into consideration those who are undocumented? Because they might have wages that are under minimum wage and especially for affordability and right to drinkable water. How are we taking that all into consideration? one better but um, that's a big challenge right and, and how, how you come up with a household level individual level sort of analysis and, and try to avoid masking those that they are vulnerable um, right now we are not really taking into account the rentals the, the multifamily the undocumented and, and other other communities um, I think the 20th percentile of median household income gets into it a little bit uh, the, the minimum wage maybe a little bit, uh, but, um, but still, I, I'm not sure. Um, we are not doing it right now. I don't know, Kurt, do you want to add to that one? Do you have any? Um, no, I mean, it's a great question. And you know, there are a couple blind spots in this research typically, and, and some people have met it, uh, suggested already, you know, renters, uh, multifamily housing, uh, uh, undocumented immigrants. And so it really would require, um, taking kind of this uh, multidisciplinary approach where you bring in scholars that typically work on immigration issues or, or with immigrant families, um, and you work with community members that have connections within the, the immigrant and undocumented immigrant family, because it's all about data and how do we get the data. And if I go in there, um, there may be some trust issues if I'm not familiar with the communities, right? And so you need kind of this holistic approach and it takes time and, and resources and funding to do that. It is, a, it is a blind spot, so I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, and I guess there's people in here that um, can maybe do, help do something about it with us, and we'd be glad, glad to look at it, but great question. Anyone else want to? Right now we are working with uh, senior communities and how the affordability might be a different challenge, but we are working with Riverside County of Office of Aging. We basically, they require a lot of data on who are these communities, what type of expenses they have that might be additional to, to uh, average, you know. So, so this, again, um, great question, yeah. Wait, I, I think I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, I am Ono from Olton Nigel Water District. Um, so my question, and great presentation, thank you all. Um, my question is kind of in line with the previous question just asked because I see like a lot of the studies, even the regulatory agencies, when they provide some income assistance, it's based on the data on the zip code level. And I have seen a lot of the studies takes into account like single family residential. Uh, whereas like even like within our water district, I can see like very affluent single family residential, whereas the multifamily is below like the median income level or 
like they have a huge like disparity. So how do we overcome the challenges when we provide like any kind of income assistance based on the um, border district level data or zip code, zip code level data when we like um, have like tough time accessing the multifamily level, you know, and the variable, so much of variability even within a water district. And I, I, a, a very interesting question, and I think um, the, the research question that comes out of this is to what extent is the water bill capitalized into rental rates uh, and sort of making housing uh, even more unaffordable than it already is. So I think there's a difference um, in, uh, in the type of analysis you would have to do, whether renters are paying their own water bill or whether it's the landlord paying the water bill and then it would be capitalized into the rental price. Um, I don't know if there's research connection. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think um, a great response, right? We, we have that challenge with, with how much of that goes to your rent. And, and even the water use data, that sometimes we don't have at the, at the rental single house level, right? But one thing we are, we are trying to explore is um, percent rental within the districts and, and see how, that, um, how we can uh, come up with a better measures, uh, like Long Beach and, and some other areas that you are, are, are much more rental and dense and, and then, than, than, let's say, eastern area, right? So, so we we're trying to use that type of variation to see how, how we can address that. But yeah, uh, big challenge. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Joe Mawad, Eastern Municipal Water District. Uh, great, great information. Uh, really enjoyed the presentations. Question for, for Mara. Um, I was really interested in the analysis that you did relative to the decrease in water quality violations relative to consolidations that occurred. Was that data also analyzed relative to affordability, meaning did you look at the impact on affordability as a result of consolidations of struggling and, and uh, uh, failing water systems? I, I personally did not, but I think that would be an excellent uh, question for future research. I think we're figuring out a lot of, yeah, overlaps and connections uh, between these various studies. Thank you. All right, one uh, time for two more questions. Everyone, thanks for your presentation. Uh, Mark Long, uh, UCR School of Public Policy. Um, this may be a very naive question because I, I should say I don't know a lot about water policy, but I was thinking about um, the idea of water as a right, but also the issue of, that Charlotte raised about efficiency in water use with uh, lawns um, and turf. Um, so as an economist, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, well, if water is a right, we'd like to provide some of it to everyone for free up to a point, but beyond that point, we would want to price it such that the usage of the water isn't, um, isn't recognizing, is, is recognizing its true cost. So my question is, why don't we simply do that? Why, why do we not provide, and again, this is a simple question, why don't we provide a certain amount of gallons per person or per household or however you could do it, and then provide a, a, a price that is appropriate to account for the uh, overuse. Thank you. Great point. Uh, there is one type of pricing structure that seeks to address this very issue. Uh, it's called tiered pricing, and it's become much more prevalent across the state of uh, California. So um, the idea is there uh, is a certain amount of water. The first few units of water are provided for a relatively low price. In lesser uh, developed countries, sometimes this block of water is provided for free. It's called a lifeline uh, rate. And then after that point, the, the water rates go up. And especially in California, the intent has been to encourage efficiency uh, as you crank up the water rate. So, no, great question, and uh, so just to add to that, um, we have Prop 218 in California that, um, that doesn't allow agencies to provide uh, free water at any level, right? But the agencies become more and more and, uh, sort of innovative, the tier rates, but also the budget-based rates. Like we know at Eastern, um, 
their, their first tier or first budget uh, is based on the lowest cost of water and, and that's the cheapest water source available to them. Uh, so that's, that's one part. And there are some private water utilities that they do provide lifeline support, which they are not under Prop 218, they are regulated by CPUC in California. So in electricity is much more common, but in water because of, I think mainly because of Prop 218, that, that, that's not allowed. So yeah, the Prop 215, just quickly, and there are people that are much better experts on this than me, but you, have, you can't charge more than the cost of delivering the water, and you can't charge uh, two people different amounts for the same type of water. Uh, there's a lot of nuance in that. Um, there's some experts in here. Michael Hannum would be someone you might want to talk to uh, during the break about, about research on this issue. Uh, but it, is, it does hamstring the agencies unless they've got some resources uh, to get ready for a court battle. Uh, in terms of kind of differentiating between pricing and, and, and the amount of water people get. Um, uh, but yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Hi, hello. Uh, I know we're in short on time, but on the topic of uh, housing uh, affordability, uh, it's been almost a year and a half, maybe over, since the passing of uh, SB 10. And I remember how exciting that was, and there's a lot of examples of cities that aren't taking advantage of it. But I was wondering if you had, uh, Stan, any examples of cities that have been taking advantage of SB 10 since uh, November 21? Um, yeah, great question, actually. So um, up, uptake of SB 10 has been somewhat slow, um, which, I mean, we, we would expect or not expect, um, given, you know, the sort of outcry and the pitchforks and torches that upzoning a city can have. Um, the big exception to that, and I think really a, a leader in pro-housing, forward-thinking policy in California has been San Diego. San Diego has been, um, or it has in discussions to upzone quite a large portion of its city, especially areas near mass transit. So the city has um, done a lot of investment in bus rapid transit and uh, now with a light rail line that connects um, the literal border of Tijuana um, up to UC San Diego in the northern end of the city. So. Um, Following those investments, um, the city is utilizing SB 10 to um, create a lot more dense multifamily housing. Um, and this comes in conjunction with its transit-oriented development um, rules, which allow builders to include fewer parking spaces and go over density and height restrictions um, near mass transit. So San Diego really has been leading the way in quite a few arenas, but SB 10 notably um, in the state. Thank you so much. For sure. Uh, that's time for this session. Let's give them a round of applause. I want to say that um, public agency can offer lifeline rates. They just can't use rate revenue to do it. So they can use other types of revenue. And if, that, if that's wrong, I'm sure uh, the second panel will, will correct me on that. But um, uh, um, So now, I mean, there's been some discussions this morning about um, uh, reliability and infrastructure. And under the new climate change regime, we understand, especially since the last time we held this symposium, I think we're more aware of the changing climate uh, than we were back in 2019. And so um, if, you know, water rates are to some extent some function of water costs, and if water costs are some function of reliability and supply, it makes sense that we'd want to hear from a, an organization that wholesales uh, water to over 150 uh, agencies and that serve um, uh, over 19 million people. So I'd like to invite up the, uh, my next uh, speaker would be, I'd like to invite up uh, Ordain, uh, Adan Ortega Jr. Uh, Adan is the chair of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. He leads a 38 member board of directors representing each of the district's 26 member agencies across Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Ventura counties. As chair, he represents district policies and programs nationally and locally and works collaboratively with the board to respond to climate change challenges and ensure a reliable supply of high quality drinking water for Southern California. He is the first Latino chair to be elected to the post and the first former Metropolitan employee to serve in this role. Chair Ortega has three decades of experience in government and has helped lead efforts to bring assistance to small community water systems in disadvantaged communities across the state. So for this session, I'd like to start off with a sit-down 
and ask Chair Ortega uh, three questions before we open up to the audience. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a little fireside here, so we can't do the fireside chat. Um, but here are the, the, the questions I'd like to pose to Chair Ortega, and thank you very much for making time and, and, and for this. So in the second panel, we're going to hear from a few Water District general managers who will discuss the challenges of providing affordable, reliable, and safe drinking water. Where does MET, which wholesales, again, over to 150 retailers, uh, which serve over 19 million people, fit into this affordability issue, i.e., what role has it played, if at all, and what role can it or should it play? Thank you, Kurt. It's uh, wonderful to be with you all. This is, I think, the second time I've been at this affordability conference, and I want to give kudos to the staff at UCR and also our partner member agencies, uh, Joe uh, Maud here, and Craig Miller from Western Water, uh, Eastern Municipal Water District. Um, you know, the, this question is interesting because what Metropolitan does is that we wholesale water that comes in from Northern California and the Colorado River and we create the benchmark in our rates uh, for incentives uh, for things like water conservation. Um, and uh, when we benchmark, for example, our incentives for water recycling projects, right, it's, uh, it, you know, the assumption uh, is that the end result can be subsidized uh, so that uh, the price is in effect, at least to the user, uh, lower than the cost of imported water. Uh, so we've unbundled our rates and we have a stewardship charge on our rates, uh, but guess what's happened over the last 25 years? Um, this region has been so effective, uh, primarily because of our member agency investments, that we didn't need the drought, we didn't need climate change to reduce our sales. Uh, so our sales are now going down, our revenues are thus going down. Uh, we still have the same infrastructure to maintain, uh, and the real test here is how are we going to revamp our rates uh, so that we could sustain the investments that we have to make uh, to maintain the current system as well as to build uh, what climate change demands, which is a new class of infrastructure. Uh, so uh, that's the role that we play so far, and we're going to have to really dig deep and think very seriously about the implications in this region to affordability. We have the majority of poor people in California within our service boundaries. Um, and so affordability, uh, given that we have a human right to water in California, uh, is a key factor. Um, the role that Metropolitan can play in the future, uh, I think, is yet to be imagined, uh, but if you'll hang with me for just a second. All of the agencies here provide you safe drinking water, each and every one of you. You can get in your car and drive up uh, the 99 or the 5, and you might get thirsty. Uh, you stop at one of these little towns that you hit before you get to Fresno or right after, and you may be drinking from a drinking fountain uh, that has high levels of arsenic or high levels of nitrates. Uh, that the local residents drink. And my question to you is, what happened to your human right to water? You know, what happened to the state's guarantee that there ought to be safe drinking water for every resident for our basic uses, um, no matter where you find yourself? And so right now, we have a very distributed concept about the human right to water uh, that takes as a given that we're static and that we're only going to get it by the utility that serves us. Um, but we're not static, we're residents of a state, and we deserve to have safe drinking water no matter where we find ourselves. So I think we can play a role in beginning to challenge the notion that safe drinking water is only something to expect in your own home. I think we can join with others in creating that expectation that it ought to be there no matter where you find yourself. Thank you. Um, my second question then is, over the past few months, and perhaps longer, you've mentioned the case of San Diego in terms of its investments in reliability, but at the cost of higher water rates. Is MET following perhaps a similar game plan in terms of investing in local reliability, perhaps with the idea of less investment in importing water from the north? And if so, will there be higher costs and water rates for SoCal customers? Well, that's a good question. I think Max Gomberg just had a study recently that said that if we continue to invest in the Bay Delta, that our rates would skyrocket. 
the truth is that no matter what we do, our rates are going to skyrocket. Uh, because what will happen is that if we have to reduce our reliance on the Delta, uh, we will have to increase our investments in local projects. And it's either going to happen because it's in some form the current model where we subsidize our member agencies or our member agencies are going to have to fend for themselves. And so will the retail agencies. And so rates are going to go up no matter what. Uh, the era of cheap water in California is over. And the real challenge that we have is, what are we going to do for those least able to pay their bills? Now, there is some hope here. And this is a room, I think, full of economists. And I think one area of study ought to be whether there's any elasticity in the price of water, given that while a city council gets recalled for increasing water rates, um, those same residents that would vote to recall those council members will go to the supermarket, buy water out of a vending machine uh, for a dollar a gallon. So think about it. Metropolitan, our, our rates are about $1,200 an acre foot. When it's blended with local rates, uh, the average cost of water, I understand, out of the tap is about a third of a penny. And yet people are willing to pay a dollar for that same gallon of water. So we, we're struggling here uh, over uh, you know, rates that are $1,200 an acre foot. And just think, th think of the calculation, a dollar a gallon, $326,000. That's what the private sector makes off of the sale of our water. Um, so what does that mean you know, for the willingness uh, to pay? I think NRDC did some studies uh, back in the early 2000s showing that uh, the people that primarily pay those rates uh, for that bottled water are poor people, immigrants, and very rich people. And what we say to ourselves is, well, you know, these immigrants, they bring their notions from the old country and they don't, they don't know any better. Um, or those rich people don't care and they're willing to pollute the environment with plastic bottles. But in what industry where people, ex where the vendor expects you to consume something and put it in your body, um, in what industry do they not try to sell their value proposition and the quality of the product that they serve? And so I think uh, reaching some kind of a mentality in the water industry where we're more willing to assert our value proposition, given the billions of dollars that we invest, I think, the cost of safe drinking water and water quality is the biggest cost driver in water rates in California uh, and, in, and at the Metropolitan Water District. So I think that's something to think about as we're trying to calculate other alternatives and strategies for paying the costs that we need to pay and for determining what people are willing to pay. Thank you. Um, my last question, and maybe it's wrapped up a little bit with the other two, so you probably provided some partial answer. but. Um, how do you see climate change affecting water affordability in California? And what role does uh, MET play in addressing this issue? Climate change plays a huge role. Um, so currently, about a quarter of all the water that we consume in the region comes from the Bay Delta. And the politics in the Bay Delta are such that we're on a course to mutually assured destruction. If something doesn't happen, that changes the dynamics about the Delta. And the way I think about the Delta is that uh, it was a crudely altered landscape. Uh, for the last 100 years, um, that landscape has meant that the environment has hung on by a shoestring. We're not the first generation uh, to challenge the health of the Delta. You know, the mining uh, operations, um, as those levees were being built, polluted it with mercury and these tidal waves of mud that covered towns. Um, at the same time, we had a prediction by Jeff Mount uh, back in uh, 2002 that said that within a 50-year time horizon, the delta could be destroyed by either a seismic event or a weather event. And we kind of saw a little bit of that this year. Notwithstanding that, we know that sea level rise is going to introduce salt into the delta and it's going to contaminate our sources of water. But think about of climate change and where the politics of the Delta, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but I'll tell you where it's at. I think that what's driving the politics right now are um, 
uh, two different extremes that both depend on the destruction of the delta. I think there's people out there that believe that if this cataclysm happens, that we will have to build the delta conveyance, that there'll be no choice, and we're gonna have to build this tunnel under the delta to bypass these areas that are very fragile. And I think on the other end, um, there's the hope that if the delta is destroyed, it'll be restored. And the real question is, restored to what? The climate that existed when, before these levees were built doesn't exist anymore. And so I wonder if we can open a new dialogue about stabilizing the delta, which means that we would stabilize the delta so the environment finally, after 130 years or so, has a chance to thrive in some way. Um, those farms and those uh, uh, towns in the delta uh, survive drought and we get to have some stability in our water supplies because what'll happen if we don't have water from the Delta, our cost of water recycling will go up. And in fact, we might have to do less of it. So it could bring less reliability in more ways than people imagine and drive up the cost of water that comes out of the tap. Thank you. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite up anyone who would like to ask uh, Chair Ortega any questions. I've got about five, a little over five or less than 10 minutes. Talking and hope it works? Okay, good. Um, I'm Nicole. I'm a postdoc here at UCR uh, in environmental sciences. Um, I have earned my PhD in, in environmental toxicology and I focus on analytical chemistry to give you a bit of where my question's coming from. Um, so currently we feel that recycled water is not necessarily safe. We also feel that potable water is collected from rivers that are flooded with effluent and treatment is still insufficient to protect human and ecosystem health. Plus we have treatment facilities that we saw that violate health standards currently. Um, and they are only covering a small portion of the hundreds of unregulated organic chemicals that are present in treated wastewater. So um, these chemicals include, as you're probably aware, personal care products, pharmaceuticals, flame retardants, endocrine disrupting compounds that um, are of concern. Um, and so I guess what I'm wondering is how are we able to say that we are indeed providing safe drinking water to all? Because it is, and I'll give you an example. Uh, relatively speaking, it's a relative thing, right? Is it the purest substance on earth that people drink and, um, and there'll never be a health effect or anything wrong with it? Uh, I don't think there's any product like that in the world. Uh, but if you look at what was the leading contributor uh, to the expansion of our lifespan, um, in the year 2000, Life Magazine did this interview with all these scientists, and what was it? It was disinfection of water and pasteurization. Um, our lifespans went from about you know, 35 to 40 years uh, to 50s, 60s, and now it's going in, into the 80s. So I think there's been a great progress in our civilization overall in reducing uh, risk of early death uh, because of the stressors to our immune system and to our bodies that create aging and other things. Now, I'm really worried about the acute contaminants that are out there that can kill you. I mean, if you're, if you're taking, if you're drinking high dosages of, of, of um, arsenic or nitrates, you know, there's other substances that are like that that can harm you. I think we need to do everything we can to, to stop that. And I think the state water board has been addressing that, uh, particularly as we're trying to bring systems into compliance on the arsenic standard, for example. But there's a whole list of other contaminants that uh, pose a, a percentage of risk um, that is in the millions. Um, where if we spend X amount of dollars, we might reduce one chance of cancer in a population of what you tell me, 30,000 people, uh, or 100,000 people over a 30-year period. 
And I'm not saying that we shouldn't invest in that, but we need to be more strategic in how we invest in that. Uh, in Japan, for example, after that nation was destroyed in World War II, they created what, what you might consider a national economy of scale. When they implement new regulations to reduce risk even further, what they do in Japan is that they let the big me megalopuses go first to drive down the cost of the technology and the treatment so that the smaller, more rural communities can be brought up at the back end uh, within, a, within a reasonable period so that everybody gets that risk reduction benefit. In California, we don't do it that way. As I noted earlier, it's everybody for themselves. And so if I live in a very wealthy community that can implement the latest technology you know, to get rid of things like PFAS and chromium-6 and these contaminants that are very expensive, they'll get the benefit. But if you live in some of these small towns uh, and in some of the poor areas, uh, you know, we'll be looking at charts here about how they're out of compliance. Uh, but that doesn't do us any good unless we have a strategy for implementing that technology over a period of time that society can afford. Um, so that's my answer. Sorry for my long-winded answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to follow up then, um, acute toxicity is obviously extremely important. Um, but chronic toxicity is also extremely Absolutely. important. Um, and with the plethora of chemicals that we're exposed to through our drinking water, um, it, it is no wonder why some people choose to purchase bottled water at much more of an expensive rate than what you provide. Um, and I guess You're absolutely right, and there's no disagreement. And what I hope that the researchers and will do. And cancer rate has extremely been on the rise for the last 30 years. Well, I, I think that what science is also, I think we're detecting more types of cancer that are out there. Uh, 50 years ago, people would die of what they would call natural causes. We don't call those natural causes anymore. We call it cancer. And we know that there's triggers, you know, that create those conditions. But I think that we need to address these issues strategically uh, because I don't think anybody's going to find it acceptable that we bankrupt society and leave people out. And right now, the people that get left out of those benefits are the poorest people in our society who can't afford the treatment to deal with these issues that you've raised. Right, yes. Yeah, so one of the, we have one to of those... actually move on at this point. You've had a couple questions, and I really wanted to limit it so we don't. But, you, but thank you for your question. Afterwards, if you want to continue the dialogue, let's figure out a way to do that, Nicole. It'd be great. And these are important questions, so we don't want to stifle it, but in the interest of time right now, we, we have to move on, but um, we're happy to continue this discussion offline. Thanks. Um, last question, and then we'll move on. Uh, hello, my name is Yvette Torres. I work with an environmental justice org here in the Inland Empire, and although <clears throat> right now we are working on tracking infrastructure development around the Inland Empire, and as we see for a lot of a of our water infrastructure to go into communities, especially unincorporated communities. They require warehouse projects or logistics projects to come in. Um, and as you were talking about the Delta and um, water prices increasing and also climate change and infrastructure, seeing that infrastructure is such a big issue here in the Inland Empire to even get water to community in the first place, I'm just wondering what are some conversations or research or next steps um, folks are taking at the water district level for that to come where we see logistics maybe using more of the cleaner water and communities don't even have access to water here, mostly in unincorporated areas? That's a very good question. Uh, that's why Metropolitan in February launched our Climate Adaptation Master Plan. Uh, what we believe is that our resource strategies have to dovetail to what the local agencies are doing. And then we also need to find a way uh, to deal on a more general basis uh, with the affordability question. Um, I think that there's a commitment on the part of our board and our general manager, Adel Haji Khalil, that no matter what we do, we can't leave people behind. That if we're going to have strict standards and we're going to expect everybody to comply that there be hope for those people that live in the poorest communities of California that there is a plan to bring them that technology so that they can have safe drinking water. 
Um, I think in terms of reliability, uh, our sales are down. And so you have to ask, what happens with that water that people are not buying? Well, a lot of that water is ending up in our reservoirs uh, where it becomes an asset. And so one of the things that I think our climate adaptation planning will contemplate, I mean, uh, water is, I think, a more tangible, uh, fungible substance than carbon. And if our agencies were getting credit for the portion of that water that's stored and allowed to transact it to areas that don't have it, you know, it could, there could be multiple benefits where Metropolitan can generate some revenue for storing that water, the agencies can generate revenue from selling it, and those receiving it can also sell it to their customers and raise revenue in a way that we haven't raised revenue before. I'm not saying that's the answer. I've seen that idea proposed. I think it's exciting if we could make it work. Um, but I think that there's strategies that we're going to have to employ uh, to monetize our efficiency. And I think that's something that hasn't really been talked about very much. And I think it could bring benefits to areas of, of California and Southern California uh, that don't have the complete service that they're entitled to. One example, uh, some, you mentioned PFAS earlier. Uh, there are communities within our system and the metropolitan system that exceed the response level for PFAS. And they don't have a connection. They, their property, you know, their taxpayers have been paying property taxes for over 50 years for the benefit of being able to switch on our water if they ever need it, and they can't. And that's a big inequity that we're going to have to resolve. Western Municipal Water District just resolved a, a similar issue in the community of Rubidoux, where the cost of building a pipe you know, to provide them with imported water would have been $10 million or more. And they were able to reduce that cost you know, by doing a creative arrangement with agencies that had connections closer to Rubidoux. And that was a very elegant solution. You know, it took a little wrangling, a little negotiation, but in the end, it was achieved. And so we're going to have to be creative like that going into the future. Thank you for your question. All right. Um, thank you very much, Shadan. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Um, we're going to, it's, it's a less than an hour before we take our lunch break. So let's just take a five minute break if you need to go to the restroom, stretch your feet. We'll come back and we have the next panel that is going to talk about some of these challenges uh, associated with providing clean, safe, affordable drinking water. Um, we've got a provider that uh, in the trenches providing rate assistance. And we also have um, a community organization here to talk about social justice issues with that as well. So I look forward to you all seeing you, seeing you all in about five minutes. Thank you.
Stefania, our host. Yeah, we stayed in a room in her place and every morning she'd make us coffee. <laughs> she was always like, you should go. Stand next to me, Celeste. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay. Let's um, let's uh, get started again. We only have about 50 minutes before lunchtime. So if we can uh, pause our conversations and come back and sit down. So you have any uh, keys solutions to how you get people back in the seats, Celeste? You start clapping. Okay. See, I'm learning. <clears throat> All right, oh, I like this. Has there been a symposium with more energy than this? No, uh, no, no. Thank you, Celeste. Okay, so um, this is the final panel, and uh, it's my, um, we'll be on uh, experiences, challenges, and perspectives. The moderator for this session, uh, we're fortunate to have Celeste Cantu. Celeste serves on multiple boards, including as chair of the regional, San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board, the Water Policy Center Advisory Council for the Public Policy Institute of California, vice chair of the Water Foundation, vice chair of the Water Education Foundation, Water Solutions Network Advisory Council, and the UC President's Advisory Council for Ag and Resources. Um, prior to um, uh, Ms. Contu served as general manager of the Santa Ana Watershed Project Authority, and prior to that, she served as executive director for the California State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, during the Clinton administration, she served as the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Development State Director of, for California. She served as planning director for the city of Calexico, and later as executive director for the Imperial Valley Housing Authority. She holds a bachelor's degree uh, from Yale in urban planning and policy and a master's degree in public administration from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And for anyone who in need of gardening help, Celeste is a master gardener in Riverside County. So please welcome Celeste Conte. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Well, we have a scintillating dynamic panel group for you today to keep you entertained and your minds going before we have lunch, which is not the most um, coveted position to be in right before lunch. Um, I'm gonna not, I'm gonna save some time by not introducing everybody. Their good bios are in your packet so you can read all about them and you should do that because all of these people are going somewhere, uh, not just exactly where they are right now. So what we're gonna do is talk about the implementation of all the things you heard about earlier today in real life. What it means on the ground in terms of uh, implementation if you're a water district, if you're a community member, if you're a community advocate, and what the impacts will be. So this is where the rubber meets the road. So we have agreed on four questions that will start our conversation. And this is not gonna be stand-up presentations, this is a conversation that would help us process everything that we learned today. 
So this question is for all four of you. Given that a significant percentage of our community members, and estimated really at 34% of those earning less than 200% of the medium income, confront a choice every month between food, shelter, medicine, and other essentials like utilities today. When, where, and how, as in what delivery structure, and we're talking about 218 reform, uh, subsidies from the federal state government, rate subsidies, uh, rate uh, design, which I think has a lot to do with all this. How do you, where do you see those funds coming from to help you make ends meet and to help our, our rate payers make ends meet? So Greg, I'll start with you as the largest water district at the table. Thanks Celeste and, and esteemed colleagues. Um, that's a tough question. It's a as you can see from the first panel and all the data and information that was presented, um, and, and we appreciated uh, UC Riverside with our, with our affordability study and looking at delinquencies and what we can do to better improve. Um, we all believe in the human right to water. I think it's important in that regard. And you can see from, from the data and the information, there's quite a dichotomy. Um, you know, the majority of the community water systems, the larger ones, you know, we set, most of us have budget-based rates, tiered rates, et cetera. So when we look at things, you know, we're looking at across the board in that regard. So um, affordability, even from a operation and maintenance of a water district, we're continuously having challenges ourselves. Um, you know, you saw that costs are increasing. Chair, Chair Ortega, Vice Chair Diadamo, everybody recognized that, you know, there's constant pressures against all of us and uh, you know what I can remember from third grade you know water is one of the most important things you can't survive think more than three days without water so at least that's what I remember from third grade um, and so I mean we look at that and so it's it's an essential service um, one of the things we've done and, and our board uh, has has elected to do in the staff uh, to help with the low income with the rate assistance, we have a rate assistance for residents in Elsinore Valley. Um, we call it the RARE program. Um, and as was mentioned, um, Prop 218, you're restricted from using revenue rates or ratepayer rates to do other things. We're lucky to have cell tower leases and other forms of revenue where we can offer up right now up to about $30 a month to help our customers, our low income customers who qualify to offset that impact. Uh, right now, about 70% of our low-income customers take advantage of that program. And there's a variety of reasons. I think uh, some good questions related to the data that was presented earlier. Um, data is data, but sometimes you got to really get into the field and see what's going on on the ground and what water districts experience every day. Um, and we've been working closely with Monica and her team. Uh, we offer, uh, light, you know, having folks come in, to our water district, we've given and assisted in over two hundred fifty thousand dollars for our low-income rate assistance, uh, our low-income customers to do that. So, um, it was mentioned about Prop Two Eighteen. I think uh, that was mentioned. We are, like I said, restricted. It's by law, and I want to make sure that people understand that Prop Two Eighteen is not the enemy. It, it, it was put in place to protect agencies from overcharging. We only charge for what we provide. We don't make a profit as a municipal water agency. We pay what we need to do, debt covenants, et cetera, et cetera. It's very complicated, but we don't make any profit. So we only charge for the rates or for the services and the cost of goods that's provided. So, and that's by law. And that's a good thing because otherwise, and you've probably seen it, agencies have overcharged or have not done an actual analysis of why rates are charged a certain way, and it's very arbitrary. So that actually protects you, all of you out there who, who get a water service from a municipal provider. So um, I think that's what I'll cover at this point. Okay, so we run the low income household water program, and I would say one of the things that we do have going for us in California is that after this federally funded program sunsets in September, on September 30th, the state funded um, LIWAP 2.0 will kick in. Um, and that's not something that most other states in the, United, in the, the country can say. Um, 
that's going to be a huge, huge for our state and our county because the need is great. Um, I know at the federal level they are talking about implementing the program on a continuous basis, like the electric and gas that we also run through Community Action. But the, some, the part that makes everybody nervous is that they're trying to bucket it all together in the same pocket of money. So then customers, um, applicants, will then have to decide whether um, between electric, gas, and water because it's all going to come from the same source. And then that would almost pit all the utilities against each other. So we're trying to avoid that and keep it separate as it is now. Um, so that's one thing that is considered, that is being talked about on the horizon. Uh, thank you. And I think just to start, I want to I differentiate. Um, I think LIWAP, LIWAP is doing good work out there. The arrearages and the debt funding that was happening for the State Water Board is doing good work. I think there's a lot of room to improve um, I know Riverside County is an exemplar in California, um, but just some statistics on the LIWAP program. Uh, North Carolina has served 75,000 households since the program began. California has served 14,000 households. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that California is leading on making sure that debt can be, crisis assistance can be provided to families who need it. And I think with LIWAP 2.0 and having a state program without some of the federal requirements, particularly around things like residency, is gonna be a great thing to see improvement in program delivery there. Um, but just getting at people who are falling behind doesn't really address the root of the issue, which is unaffordable water rates to begin with. And I think Celeste pointed out some of the, the choices that people have to make when they're falling behind in debt. Most people want to pay their water bill, provided that it's fair and they can afford it. And if they're struggling to do that, that means they're potentially making cuts in other areas, housing, uh, food, childcare, um, you know, entertainment, which everybody needs to survive. And so uh, what we're working for as an organization is really pushing to make sure that water rates become affordable in the first place. And, and how do we get there is, is a really difficult question. I don't think there's a single answer to do that. Um, I think that if we were able to provide a limited exemption to Proposition 218 and not wanting to take away any of the consumer protections or anything like that that I think are good to have um, in that, in, in the law, uh, but allowing for some of these systems in areas like Los Angeles, some of the larger systems who can provide using ratepayer funds their own program would be a very easy way to do that. Uh, if, that's, if we're not able to do that by allowing for some of these systems to self-fund and create their own programs, then the other option to create an affordability program is state funding with state mandates. And I think that would be even more uh, uh, unpopular with some of these agencies who do have the resources internally to be able to set up the systems themselves. Um, but there still is going to be a role for state funding, uh, and that's because so many systems in California are, are just not able to do something like this on their own. There's so many small systems or systems that, that serve predominantly low-income communities that, that don't have the ratepayer base to, to offer the assistance necessary. And some of the, the figures are, are very shocking. Uh, in, uh, you know, we work in, in San Gerardo and the Central Coast out, out near Salinas and their water bills are over $100 a month there. And that's for water folks can't drink. Uh, there's a community called El Porvenir in Fresno County that our partner Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability works at. Their fixed rate is $280 a month before their even volumetric rates kick in. So there's, and, and these are communities that are often far away, they're rural communities, so it's not like we can consolidate them with other communities. Um, so state assistance will eventually be needed there, and I think we just, we'll have to figure out what that looks like going forward. Um, I think uh, the federal government also has a role to play in this. Um, they're doing some work funding LIWAP there. Um, there's also, as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, a US EPA LIRA pilot program that was never funded. Uh, it was supposed to be funded through Build Back Better, uh, which never happened. Uh, so advocates across the country are continuing to push to get funding into that US EPA program. Uh, and then finally, I just want to mention infrastructure and how important it is to continue to have infrastructure funding, which lowers the cost of projects needed to make water safe. Um, in California, we're lucky to have the SAFER program that Didi mentioned to be able to get operations and maintenance funding in so that when we're building projects, we're not raising rates so high that the community can't afford to run the system anymore. Uh, that's, that's not everywhere. And our California program only lasts until 2030 and the funding is, is not ideal. So uh, making sure we think about how we do infrastructure funding, not only having regular rounds of infrastructure funding, 
uh, but expanding what that funding can be used for to make sure that it's not impacting affordability is important so that we're not forcing families and, and communities to choose between water that's affordable or water that's safe. Thank you, Celeste, and uh, thank you, uh, UCR, for, uh, for having me here. For, uh, for Lake Hemet, and, and by the way, has anybody been up to Lake Hemet, know where it's at? All right, we've got a few. It's a beautiful place. I'm, I'm blessed to have grown up in our service area since the 70s, and, uh, and Lake Hemet really is, is a gem. But for our, our customers, the majority of them are in a DAC, um, and I, I would have lost some money uh, pre-pandemic if I had to uh, guess how many people or services would have been delinquent. And we're prepared for the worst, but I was I was incredibly surprised that about one percent through COVID, with the moratorium on 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 shutting off services, less than one percent of the services ended up being delinquent. And uh, I'll follow that up with the uh, with the compliment to the state, uh, not only for the COVID arrearages, um, but for LIWAP and the CAP. Um, they've made it so streamlined uh, to get that money um, back to us. COVID arrearages were about two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, LIWAP uh, last year was about 30, and it's increasing already this year. We're, we're over $20,000, and it's been incredibly simple for our staff to, uh, to implement. Um, at first, when rate assistance was being discussed, I don't know, 10 years ago, I, I was concerned that we as a district were going to have to get into uh, income evaluation and where that poverty level was at, but because of CAP and the states and, and, and their program, it's made it incredibly simple for us. So um, I hope that continues. I hope that extension is approved because um, that, that's been, been great for us. Uh, for us as a water agency, it, you know, our end is we got to lower our costs. We got to keep our costs as low as possible. Um, it's kind of timely. I'm going to our board this afternoon with our budget for the next year. And uh, that's going to always be uh, on the uh, minds of, of our board members. Um, my, uh, my mom lives in our service area, my, my son does, my grandkids, my friends that I, that I know about. So they, they hold us to account um, when we aren't doing our job and, and think, I, I think, think we are, um, but there's always better ways for us to do that and we're looking forward to it, so, so thank you. The Inland Empire, particularly this area, is particularly rich with water resources and we have you know, the God-given groundwater and we've been we've benefited from the most sophisticated professional uh, water managers uh, in California to make sure they plan for the future, and all of that shows today. Um, when we look into the future, we know that the pressures for the cost of water are going to be enormous. Climate change is going to require tremendous adaptation, and none of that is inexpensive. It is all incredibly expensive. Uh, cost of chemicals is going up. We had a shortage of. Uh, of chlorine this last year, which I never thought we would see that. Cost of regulation is going up as we, as science gives us more windows and we understand more about what's in the water and how it affects our health, there will be continued increase in regulatory um, guidelines that, that help us meet those, uh, those rates. So we just discussed what we're seeing today. And a lot of what we heard this morning was about what we're seeing today. But looking into the future, factoring in all of those pressures, how do you think water districts and the communities that they serve will manage with these increased costs? And I guess we'll start with Greg again. Thanks, Celeste. Um, I think, you know, you saw the data. Uh, again, um, we're coming out of an entire world pandemic. Um, and that is disrupted. It kind of alludes to the the item that uh, Celeste mentioned, the chemicals. Who would have thought that you know we'd be almost fighting and horse trading over chlorine, which is so essential to the disinfection process uh, that we use for water and even in the wastewater systems. Um, so it's it's like anything else. The it's we're going to continue to see rising costs. That's just the reality of it. Similar to what Mike was saying too, we, we look at cutting everything. So when I saw increases, and we saw, and I'll, I commend the staff, they, they do the Herculean effort of looking at it. They look at, in the board, um, they look at what can we do to offset these 20, 30% increase in chemical costs and supply costs. We got you know backlogs in electrical systems for construction projects. Um, we're seeing 30, 40% increases in our, in our construction projects alone based on the economics and, and 
well, we have a whole bunch of economic folks here and, and stuff, is when you infuse trillions of dollars into economy, you know, it, it, the result is inflation and other things that come up and prices go up, supply and demand. Um, we at Elsinore Valley, we have about $500 million in capital projects. We have an expansion of our regional wastewater plant. We have to, um, we're, we're upgrading our Canyon Lake water treatment plant. Uh, and oh, by the way, it's the only surface water body in the state of California, yay for us, that has PFAS in it. So we have to add additional treatment because of PFAS. And so we're seeing all these, uh, you know, so $500 million add 40% to that, just because of the, in, in, uh, the econ you know, what's going on in the supply chain, things that we have no control over. And I bring up PFAS and, oh, we haven't talked about microplastics yet. Um, but, you know, Vice Chair Diadamo had mentioned those things, and so we have to deal with it. And so we do push back a little bit in the fact that when you look at these regulations, asking, and, and we all want, we're, health and safety of our water and our wastewater systems for the environmental impacts, that is our number one priority. Every, every water manager will tell you that. And so we look at it, but the reality is we can't get to zero. And there's a lot of stresses for us to get to zero. We didn't cause PFAS. We have to treat it. So, you know, no offense in, in a regard to the various folks, we didn't cause it. If we caused it, yeah, you know, hold us accountable. But the PFAS is and all these things, we don't put it in our water system. It comes from so many other sources, but we're an easy target for the regulators and others to say, you treat it. Well, we're treating it 30%, 40% increases to our construction costs, chemical, that's a rate increase. And so we want to provide safe, healthy, affordable water, but we also have all those pressures that everybody else is seeing. 30% increases in our electric rates. I don't. Any SCE folks in the, in the audience? Frustrating because, you know, we're, we're forced to pay that, and we're very energy intensive. To treat water and wastewater takes a lot of energy in order to provide you all, our customers, safe, healthy water, and that's some of the realities of it all. So, um, and again, but I do want to thank the State Water Board and the federal government and, and others because we do get low interest loans. We do get some grants to help offset these costs. And we, I have a great staff that looks, scours every opportunity to get free money or very low money. Just those low interest loans often saves our customers $70 million over the life of those loans compared to if I had to go out on the private market, just that percentage rate. So, uh, so I did want to commend that in that regard. So, yes, your rates are going up. <laughs> what are you going to do about it, Monica? How are you going to help people make ends meet in the future? I think I'm going to turn it back on everybody else, um, though, especially the water districts, and really ask for systems, that we really need systems in place. LIWAP is new, and I think... Um, to Kyle's point, millions of dollars are at risk of being left on the table in California, not in Riverside County, but um, every other county, um, because of the fact that there wasn't systems in place to easily communicate with the water districts. Everything's very decentralized, um, so information is hard to get to the right people that we need to actually implement these type of assistance programs. Uh, the need is there. There's no doubt about that. And I think a lot of the communities that get overlooked is our senior population. They are on fixed incomes, those with disability. Um, when these increases happen, they have nowhere to pull from. And climate change is gonna be the most affected in these communities as well, because they're less resilient to these type of changes, increases, gas, electric, everything's going up at the same time. And there's nowhere to pull from except for the little bit of money that they have on the side for food, for rent. Um, for the gas, but food, gas, everything else is going up. So it's a, it's a huge hurdle for a lot of our communities. Um, other systems policy changes maybe to the way programs are implemented because a lot of times they're one-time assistance per contract. And if they're um, making, having a hard time making ends meet one month, it's not gonna change next month. It's not gonna change six months from now because social security is not gonna change. Um, so different things like that that we need to really think about and how it really affects those end users um, because we see it on a daily basis. We see the faces to the statistics and we hear the stories and we know that the need is only going to get higher as the climate change continues to affect our neighbors.
Uh, yeah, I think, I, you know, I definitely sympathize with the challenge that water managers have to go through, with, particularly with emerging contaminants that are industrial in nature, like PFAS. And, uh, that, that one's really tough. And, and thankfully, the Attorney General did sue 3M about uh, that. And so hopefully there will be able to be hold them accountable for the, the, the impacts. And I think a few things. Um, again, investments, investments, investments. It's just going to take more money, um, unfortunately. And ideally, we don't have that fall on ratepayers. Um, and that's going to take uh, action from the federal government to do something about this. And, and it should be a priority. We should, we should as a nation, prioritize maintaining the, the system that many of us come to expect, which is affordable water that we can drink out of our tap. Um, and, and as we work to continue not only to bring that to so many people who haven't had that, but to, to preserve that in the face of contamination and climate change, it's, it's going to take a, a group effort there. And, and then finally, I'd like to look into why are we, why are we letting uh, these companies uh, put products into, or put chemicals into consumer products in the first place that we're finding out decades down the line are, are causing cancer and ending up everywhere. Um, PFAS, and, uh, you know, is unfortunately, the uh, Center for Biological Diversity just came out with a study saying that it's in 40% of the pesticide used in California. So that's probably going to be a real big problem in the groundwater uh, basins that we're working in in the, in the agricultural areas of the state. And it's, it's unfortunate that, yet again, the, the, the low-income communities of color are on the front lines are, the, are facing these impacts while uh, folks were able to market and sell these products for decades. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe they'll be held accountable, but it's not going to be to the extent they should be. Well, the simple answer is yes. Our, our costs are going to increase. I think since our last symposium here in 2019, uh, CPI in Riverside went up 23 percent um, just since then, and that's across the board. Our capital projects um, really have tripled. Um, our pipeline uh, replacement projects, even rather mundane projects such as that, have tripled in price and the, the per unit foot cost to us. It's caused us to restructure uh, how we uh, configure those pipeline replacements. We're going to, we tend to defer some of those until they really uh, have a demonstrated need. Um, so yes, it, they are going to increase. Uh, we are faced with uh, next year, half of uh, the new vehicles that we purchase um, have to be electric vehicles. And that goes all the way up through our dump trucks, our, our heavy duty service trucks. Um, the studies show that, that they're going to be cheaper for us. Um, but I think there's still a part, part of me at least that says, uh, I, I hope that's the case, but we'll uh, wait to be uh, uh, the final deciding uh, factor on, on that. Uh, development as our, uh, the demand in our system continues to increase. The lower costs of water have already been developed, are already being implemented. So every drop of water that we have to uh, go look for now uh, is going to be tend to be the, the higher cost of, of, of water. So we have, we're looking at ways where we're trying to shift that risk on onto new developers, at least in our service area. Um, but those are all factors uh, in addition to what's already been said that's gonna definitely increase uh, the cost going forward. So if there was a silver lining to the whole COVID epidemic, it was we saw unprecedented public uh, investments from the federal government and also from the state government. Investments not only for large infrastructure projects that benefit at water districts, and some of that is yet to be implemented, but also to direct payments to people who really needed that money. We're probably not going to see that going forward. So this crisis that we see developing today, which we are, which is already documented, is going to get exacerbated. One of the ways, and we also know that historically we've really relied on the rate payers in California to pay uh, more than 80% of all of the cost of delivering water and wastewater. So we have to really stretch our minds to figure out, well, where, how are we going to finance this? Rates can't be the source exclusively going forward. Public investment, if we could keep it up, that would be just wonderful. But the costs are enormous. And probably greater than what we can even imagine the federal and state public investments. So it really begs, begs the question, how do we do everything we do differently in a way that would be more efficient, more preventive of uh, pollution in the future, better housekeeping today? And one of the things that has been talked about that comes to mind, and I would like to know all of your opinion of this, 
is instead of the institutional designs of what we currently have of water districts that are in a large area, large region, which we have great examples of those here with Western Eastern IUA, um, and we have a lot of water districts that are situated to kind of confer, concur with political boundaries. Maybe that's a really inefficient way to think about managing you know, water that is one of the most important elements, if not the most important, uh, for our communities. And so an old idea, and an idea that is being returned to throughout the world, is looking at, instead of those little institutions, large watershed-based, uh, a large watershed-based perspective, so that you're looking first to see what you can, what water you can I, um, identify, keep clean, and keep flowing from high in the watershed all the way to the coast or to wherever it terminates, um, and secondarily look at imported water for a variety of reasons. This would require tremendous institutional redesign and a, a level of coordination that we see in some very special places here, for one, the Santa Ana watershed is one of the prime examples of this, definitely in California, uh, but we have seen others come together and try to do the same thing. Uh, this would be pretty disruptive, but I think it's very promising, and given that we don't have any other solutions, uh, maybe we should really look at it. So we're gonna start with Greg again, sorry. Um, how would you imagine if you were to operate your institution in the context of your larger watershed, the kind of coordination that it would take upstream and downstream, you don't have a lot of downstream, so you, do, you only get half, upstream, uh, to make the most of the drops, uh, not just to keep them clean for one use, but to keep them clean to be used maybe seven times, you know, multiple times, cleaning the water up uh, when it goes through the waste stream and re in adding it back to the system. How, would you, how expensive do you think that would be and what would that take? Tough question. Um, for our service area, Lake Elsinore, for those who may be familiar with it, and then Canyon Lake, we are actually at the bottom of a 750 square mile funnel of the watershed. All the water through the San Jacinto River ends up in Canyon Lake, and then when it overspills or we let release water, it goes into Lake Elsinore. So um, from that perspective, could I be king of that whole entire watershed? Heck yeah, I'd love to do that. But that's, that's not, I think, uh, the most, um, I don't know how it would work. I, I, you mentioned SAPA, uh, or, you know, Santa Ana uh, Watershed Protection Authority. Is that, yeah? Project Authority. Project Authority. So I think you're looking at, and we have that right now, sort of with our Lake Elsinore San Jacinto Watershed Authority, uh, a JPA Joint Powers, Powers Authority, where I think working together with various agencies and the regional water quality control boards play a huge role in, in helping facilitate those those aspects. I think you're bringing all players to the table. I'm not sure one large organization um, could handle everything because you have cities, counties, unincorporated areas. You have such a dichotomy of things involved, but joint powers where you're bringing experts from different areas. And I think, you know, some of the the data that, that Mehdi and Kurt and, and others have shown you is um, everything's local. I mean, prices are local, and not to discount. We definitely, one of the things with, with those, those um, areas that don't have the wherewithal income-wise, um, you know, local is, is, is where it goes. So I, I would probably say stay with more of the joint powers, the larger groups where everybody's bringing their perspective into it and working towards a common goal is kind of where I would continue with that. Unless I, you make me the benevolent dictator of that area and I'll take it. Well, Monica and Kyle, you have a little bit of a different situation. Your work as community organizers and advocacy requires a lot of coordination and cooperation across all of those institutions. So what is your thinking about how likely this might be going forward? I would say that kind of piggyback 
off a little bit of what Greg was saying is breaking down silos, um, being able to access water districts across the board instead of individually would be a huge difference in making sure these programs get implemented successfully um, because it might do really well in Lake Elsinore or Lake Hemet, but then we're seeing in some of our smaller rural districts a hesitation to even participate in the program at all. So that out, you know, all those customers are left out of assistance programs. And then a lot of our renters that end up having to pay through third party sources are completely left off the table um, and can't access assistance programs because we are not able to pay the water company directly. Um, that also includes some of the mobile home parks and other places where there's associations involved. And that's where a lot of our low, lowest income residents are found, but we're not able to assist them due to the silos in place. And additionally, I would say for funding, um, why not look to coalition building? You know, Water is a housing and a basic human right. If people don't have water in their residence, that can be an eviction. Um, like I mentioned, the seniors are definitely most affected with the higher cost of water, so why aren't we partnering with the Office on Aging um, to look for funding sources to really help the customers on the, that side of the table? Uh, so I think there's a lot of, the possibilities are endless if we think outside of the box. So how likely in, in the Tulare Lake Basin? Um, you know, I think it, it, it is going to be, it's going to vary area by area, watershed by watershed. Um, I think where we're working, there's a lot of challenges that make it to where agreement is even very difficult. And uh, I think this comes up in the work we do to push for, for consolidations, whereby we're having larger systems take on smaller systems. And oftentimes what we're finding is there's, there's, there's intentionality as to why there's a neighboring community that doesn't have the investments that other communities do. And breaking down those barriers and then forcing them together, or even asking them to is impossible. Forcing them takes a long time. Um, you know, we, we started in Tulare County and as recently as 2006, there were 16 communities that were unincorporated communities listed in the general plan as not worthy of investment. Um, and that's actually where we started organizing because you know, it's it's those are the communities that needed the help the most, and it is it is truly that these these communities maybe there's there's no difference between East Arosi and Arosi in driving. It's it's there's no spatial difference. There's no couple of fields in between these two communities, but once you get to East Arosi, there's no longer sidewalks. There's no longer street lights. Um, so there's been choices to to do to have communities face these situations uh, across the state, and so. A lot of times that has to do particularly with, you know, issues of redlining and systemic racism that's involved there. Um, so that's that's a lot to unpack and undo in, in, in doing a consolidation to put these communities together who in, in many cases don't want to be. And so I think it is going to vary, uh, but the work we're doing to continue to not only consolidate two water systems together, but build out regional water systems um, not only helps with addressing contamination and dealing with economies of scale, making sure that there's the, the ratepayer base is broader to be able to support the treatment needed, um, but we're going to keep working on that and, and pushing to that direction because it's, it's the only way to, to really achieve uh, fundamental change and make sure that we can help fulfill the human right to water in California. Kind of working our way upstream. Uh, Lake Kim is probably towards uh, the the, uh, the the ridge or the upper end of the San Jacinto watershed, and uh, we're blessed for that. Uh, Whittier and Mayberry, who built that lake back in the 1800s, uh, I, I don't think they realized how beneficial that lake would be uh, for us now. Uh, but with that, uh, we're also blessed because we have access to the Colorado River uh, through Eastern and Metropolitan's efforts, and also the Delta Water right in the San Jacinto Valley. So we're, we're blessed for that. We've got a, a mix of uses in, in our service area. About half our demand is citrus groves. They don't need potable water, um, but they also can't have uh, access or, or use recycled water just because of the impacts on the health of the trees. So we have a myriad of, of resources and demands that provide us some flexibility. Um, most of that uh, can be uh, improved on with our partnerships. Uh, Eastern has been an incredible partner with us. Uh, just recently, uh, both of our agencies completed recharge projects um, that were initially uh, created, the need for at least, because of overdrafting of our groundwater basins. Um, but with agencies, even as, as large as Metropolitan and Eastern, 
their flexibility is important because just this last month, with the rain and the, uh, that we've had in, in the central and northern parts of the state, they reacted so fast, we're already recharging water earlier in, in the game than, than normal, and we're taking advantage of those recharge facilities that we have in place now. That's gonna help us with the negative impacts of climate change going forward and being able to withstand future droughts and maintain the capacity in our, in our uh, groundwater basin. So that's incredibly important uh, for us, uh, beneficial to us. We've got half of our wells now that have already responded because of those type of efforts that are gonna provide uh, some resiliency and reliability for our system. So uh, those are things that we'll, uh, we'll need to continue going forward, um, but those partnerships are incredibly beneficial. Thank you. We saw the pandemic um, quickly changed our behavior on things that we never thought would change. We had a radical um, change of how we went about our businesses, where we did our shopping, and how we socialized, and that's just to name the top. Uh, the question is, how much of that kind of social change is, do we have the stomach for, or can we incorporate moving forward in response to climate change and these other pressures that are going to increase costs and restrict availability of what used to be, you know, inexpensive water, which we don't have any water that we can put that tag on anymore. My question for the, this group is, what kinds of behaviors that we changed in, un, because of the pandemic, would be beneficial in alleviating friction as we go forward and respond to climate change. You know, institutional design is the one that always comes up to me. Uh, lack of skills in terms of being able to do conflict resolution, we'd prefer to stay in our kingdom rather than go outside and tell somebody else that they ought to change the way they do their work because it's never well received. Uh, that conflict resolution or that ability to communicate is just a skill set that not all of us are very skilled at. Um, but are there other behavioral changes that we learn from the pandemic that will help us as we move forward in envisioning a different way of operating to be able to deliver um, affordable water, clean, safe, affordable water to everybody in California? And, it, okay, we're gonna give Greg a little bit of a break now. I think I'm gonna start with Kyle. Yeah, um, I, I think that the biggest takeaway um, from the pandemic um, that I have and, and coming into it, first of all, on communication and, and, and communication, I think that's something I'm really happy is going away. I am very happy I have so many less Zooms in my day. It's so much nicer to have in-person events, and I think that that level of communication that you, you can do in in-person is just something I'm really happy to have back, um, particularly in coalition building uh, needed to do the work to, that we need to do. Um, when it comes to any other lessons from the pandemic, I think the biggest was just how, uh, I, I, you know, when we worked to pass the human right to water over a decade ago, we've really been spent that time focusing on clean and safe water. And I think we had, you know, the AB 401 report come out there and water affordability was kind of in the back of the mind, but not something we were focused on. And then when the pandemic came and we saw that for folks, you know, you're, you're base level of protection was, you know, wash your hands for 20 seconds, sing a song. Uh, if people can't, don't have the ability to do that, they don't have the water. If the water rates are so high that turning your water on 20 seconds at a time is too long, uh, that, that's just not gonna work to protect people. And so I think we've, we've seen that, that affordable water is something that, that needs to be addressed in this country, that the levels of debt have just skyrocketed, they're still there. Uh, and so hopefully we can have an intentional focus on making sure that we do better about affordability going forward as a, a legacy of the, the pandemic. Good. Who wants to be next? Mike. Well, for, for COVID, post-COVID, uh, going through that whole process, um, and this is going to be a little bit personal to, to Lake Hemet, and, and just what I learned is the dedication of the people that, that served Lake Hemet. I was so incredibly impressed, impressed by the, their dedication. There were so many ways and excuses or reasons why people could stay home and, and get paid for it. Um, the, the sick leave, the COVID pay um, was uh, started and then it was increased as the years went on. But for, for Lake Hemet, uh, we had to be smart about it. We had to be safe. Um, but most of our workers, when they could, either decided to work from home um, if they were able, if their job descriptions and, and what they did allowed it, 
or they came into the field. Uh, our water operators, they were isolated. They worked in their own truck. They went in the field on their own, and, uh, and they came in and did their job. They didn't have to. They could have stayed at home on the couch and, uh, and, and got paid their full salary uh, multiple times over. Um, so that is one thing that, again, I would have lost uh, money on uh, because I would have bet that it would have been uh, the other way around. So uh, that's one thing I learned, uh, that our success depends so much on, uh, on so many factors, but uh, our employees' dedication uh, is one of the biggest ones. So I, I was glad to, to learn that. Who would like to be next? We are still seeing on the front lines the effects of the pandemic on a daily basis, especially the moratorium. We regularly see bills, um, not just from water, but like we also service for gas and electric. Um, five, seven thousand dollars is almost the average um, per household. And they, we are also seeing a lot of return customers who we might be able to provide them with assistance for one contract, but then they're not able to make their payment arrangements, so they get come back because they're in the same um, situation of threat of disconnection. And I think it's a lot of, it's scary to see what the outcome is gonna be because a lot of the additional funding that we received to provide this assistance for utilities is gonna be going away. Um, we're already having this really difficult process of having to prioritize the most vulnerable and having to deny a lot of people who otherwise would be eligible for our services, but because the funding is so limited compared to the need, we're having to deny, like I mentioned, people that that do need the assistance and that do qualify. And it's heartbreaking because there's not really many other places for them to go, especially when it comes to water. We are the main um, provider for water assistance and the amount that we provide. Um, the state recently increased the amount where we can pay up to 15,000. Before it was 2,000. And I think some of the other assistance programs only go up to about $200. So there's, if anything has, we have seen from the pandemic is there's a, it's put, shine a light, a huge light on the need that our residents have in this county and, and across the state. And the funding sources um, that we received from COVID helped, but the need is still there and the funding is going away. Um, I think from, from our perspective too, and kind of looking at it, um, and similar to Mike, um, you know, we, I got to commend our staff for the dedication they came in when the world, you know, we were essential services, um, essential workers, uh, but you know, our, I got to commend our folks when COVID first hit, our operators didn't flinch. They were there every day. Um, administrative staff as we worked through all those regulations and what we're supposed to do, but many of them came back into the office because we provide customer service, whether it's external to our ratepayers or internal to our each other. So, you know, contracts has to help the operations folks uh, buy stuff so we can keep doing our job. So um, in that regards, um, but the communications I think is one of the interesting points of this. I think COVID caused a lot of silos in a way. I think I agree with you. I am so happy to be face to face. Uh, I went in the office every day because you know that's what I felt I needed to be. Um, and it really does make so much, much more effective communications, working relationships, et cetera. And I do know that we have a hybrid schedule. So I, I do know when we, before we got into the full hybrid, folks were saying we miss the office and, and that's important. We need that human, human touch, that human bond being included. It's hard to, you know, it takes me 20 minutes to set up a Teams meeting for later on when I could just, hey, Christina, what do you think? Got it, done. You know, what's that, two minutes? You know, so, so much more efficient in that regards. I think, though, that one of the things that affordability-wise, Kyle made, made this comment, I, we may disagree. Um, you know, as far as what your data is from Eddie and Curtis, we feel that, and we have disadvantaged, severely disadvantaged uh, uh, customers in our area, and we work very very closely with, with, with Monica and her team and others trying to help their plight and, and improve that. We are very conscientious. Our board is very conscientious about that, it's about how we can increase our rare, how we can get this information out. There's other factors why, why there's only 70% uh, utilization, but um, we realize water quality is so important. When everybody was home, you know, we're thinking, oh, Work's done. They're not going to the office. No, actually, water use increased because everybody was home. So now, now we have to really make sure that the water quality is there. When you turn on your tap, water comes out of it, and, and we're doing a lot of projects 
uh, in a somewhat, you know, because we're also a 35% built out, we have a lot of growth coming to our service area, so we have to project for that future growth, which ties to, oh, he left, but ties to the housing issue. So uh, I think your question was about um, housing at one point or something, or one of you had asked a question about housing. You know, as a water agency, we do a will serve. We look at what's available. We do long-term urban water management plans. We don't make decisions on what goes there, how, how, warehouse, housing, whatever. We just look at what's the demands. We're not a land use agency, and what can we support? So uh, we give the same water to everybody. I don't care if you're a warehouse, you're a residential, you're a business, et cetera. The same drop of water goes exactly the same to everything. We don't, we don't discriminate in how our water gets distributed. So I just wanted to put that out. Thank you. So this panel talked about what happens on the ground floor where reality really takes place. You have an opportunity now to ask them your questions. We have enough time, I think, for some questions. Please step up to this mic and we're happy to field your questions. Paul Peschel, General Manager, <clears throat> High Desert Water District probably editorialize a little bit in my question or statement here. So <clears throat> we have a situation where the state is driving toward the 42 gallons per capita per day. That creates a challenge with economy of scale, drives up cost to customers. In terms of that, they're also restricting how much you can get credit for recycled water. They're um, also uh, in terms of the irrigated areas outside, limiting that. And if you haven't historically used irrigation, I would say they're in essence punishing you, like our area that uh, was very proactive in reducing irrigation to almost nothing, so we don't get the credit that other wealthier areas do, and we're a severely disadvantaged, disadvantaged community. So that creates real pressure on rates for our customers as it drives down, creates the economy of scale problem, we don't have the flexibility to have the quantity of water that richer areas do that have been using it on outside areas. On top of that, you have lawsuits against tiered rates, which affects your ability to address the uh, cost of water to your lower income customers. So I'm throwing that out there and I'd like your comments on that. And your question, your question is, just what do you think well, about all the above? Yeah, like your perspective on water affordability with all that tied together because that's a challenge across the board. And it seems to be, when you talk about equity and fairness, it's, it's very slanted because of the approach to this 42 gallons per capita per day. When you, when you talk about being able to irrigate more outside in the wealthier areas, being able to afford okay. it, and not being able to recycle or get the credit for recycled water and such. So... Like so let's think of this as, do you think the conservation as a way of life in California guidelines are going to disproportionately affect our lower income residents because of the design of the program? Um, yes, and, and there's always a cause and effect, and I, unfortunately I don't think sometimes regulations or legislation is completely thought through. In a, Again, you know, there's, um, you know, passion on, on multiple fronts related to why certain things. But, yeah, I mean, it's a good point because, you know, we want run three water reclamation facilities. We have long-term plans to become more sustainable locally. And, and Chair, Chair Don, Chair Ortega mentioned some of these. It's one of the challenges is we, we know that, you know, we're trying to limit our imported water. We want to be more sustainable locally. So when you reduce that... 42 GPCD in-house, that's going to go to the sewer plant. Well, that's less recycled water, or we're actually looking at potable reuse. That's going to become your drinking water, and many, many, uh, many areas are doing it. Well, that's going to increase the cost because the demands. It just changes the whole chemistry of, of treating water, and it limits the amount that we're now going to be able to use what we plan for becoming drinking water, becoming more sustainable in, in that regard. So, yeah, it's going to drive up cost because you have to treat it a little bit differently. It puts a whole change to the whole engineering and chemistry and operations of plants and different things. And, and as far as you, water use efficiency, one of the things we require in our rare program, and, and it's tiered for, for now for six people per household, whatever, there's a water use efficiency conservation 
factor in it. So that's why sometimes some of our customers don't get the month, that credit that month because they used more than their, we have budget-based rates. So they get their indoor, a certain amount of outdoor. If they go over that tier one and tier two, then they lose that, that benefit that month because you have to have a conservation portion to it. You can't just waste water and that we want to have that balancing act between it. And I think the board and the staff did a really good job designing, designing our rare program so we met a lot of what the state water board and what we want to use is California conservation, you know, water use, you know, whatever, you know, way of life. Um, just to piggyback off on that, we do agree that there needs to be a conservation effort, um, and we want to try to encourage that as much as possible. But how we see sometimes that play out with some of our customers is that they have um, pipes that are broken, but they can't repair to fix it. They don't have the money to, to repair them. Um, there's multiple families living in a household because they can't afford rent. So you have two, three families in one small area, so that increases their water usage by the normal six-person household. And there's nothing they can do about it because of finances. So as much as we try to encourage them, provide literature on conservation, the reality is often very different. I would just note that, um, you know, I think the way that the, the conservation mandate applies is there's three buckets of which, you know, th th that defines a target for individual water systems. You have your, your per capita use, your outdoor irrigation, and your leaks, um, trying to reduce leaks to a, a certain percentage. Um, and I think the intention behind a lot of this law was that most agencies would go after outdoor irrigation first because it's often there's a lot of non-functional turf that uses a lot of water in this state. Um, and primarily that is focused in, in larger properties that tend to be owned by high income earners. So that I think the intent of the law was really to focus there. And that being said, there's gonna always be some sort of externalities or just unusual situations. If you don't have a lot of irrigation to begin with, that means in order to meet your target, you, you need to go after indoor use more, more aggressively. Um, and I think Monica brought up a lot of situations why low income people might have more indoor use. And I think there's, there's more we can do as a state to uh, address indoor use um, by low-income people and help out those systems. I think about a lot of water agencies have great programs for rebates. And you know, you can go, you buy a toilet, what, 300, 350, up to 500, get a rebate for that cost. But if you're just living paycheck to paycheck, you can't make that initial investment. And so looking at how can we, how can we afford to directly install efficient, um, water-efficient appliances in low-income households and multi-unit housing um, is going to be critical because I think that's a low-hanging fruit where we haven't had that work done in conservation. And then, and then finally, um, for some systems, they may have impacts on rates in order to meet the conservation standards. Um, I would argue that oftentimes that's the conservation, because conservation and efficiency is able to create uh, sources of water that are cheaper than some of the more expensive infrastructure-heavy investments, that, that these might be lesser impacts than otherwise might have occurred. For example, if you have to go to desalination, which you know, you're know you paying thousands of dollars an acre foot of water versus conservation efficiency, it's a couple hundred. Um, but you know, operators are going to feel that pressure. And again, that's why I think low income water rate assistance and more, you know, these resources um, into help keep rates low is gonna be absolutely critical because we need to do the conservation work um, and if it's gonna have an impact on rates that people can't afford, we need to figure out a way to keep going anyways and help those people. I'll, I'll be brief. For us, we have a, a service charge that's fixed. Um, it's higher than probably most agencies are, and, but it is limited through 218. It can't generate more revenue than our fixed costs are. So we're not as vulnerable to variations in, in water use. If conservation or people use less water, uh, our, our costs go down an equivalent amount that we would lose in revenue. So our, our revenue streams are, are relatively stable in that regard. We, we don't have a budget base, but we do have a, a, a tier base that's directly correlated to our, 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 our sources of supply. One tier for uh, different categories of supply. So that's one thing that's helped, uh, helped us. We were challenged on our rates a, a few years ago. We prevailed um, uh, through 218. And thankfully, but uh, that, that's how we handle that. I want to thank this panel. I appreciate your time and your time in, pre in preparing for this. Thank you very much. And thank you, audience, for doing a wonderful job. 
Thank you to Kurt and UC Riverside for keeping this conference going. Um, I think it's really important to shine lights on this topic uh, that is only going to exacerbate as we go down the road. At this point, Kurt, do you have any, do you want me to turn the mic over to you or just invite people to eat lunch? So get your lunch and then take your seats again and be prepared to hear our assemblywoman.